Um, Clerk Segrist this evening is doing training, getting uh, prepared for next week's election. So I'd like to call for a motion uh, by uh, Trustee Foster to temporarily appoint Treasurer Slavens as our temporary clerk uh, for this meeting. Mr. Supervisor, I'd like to um, propose a motion that we appoint Treasurer Slavens as temporary clerk for this evening. Second. Those in favor of the motion as presented, please state aye. 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 The motion carries. Um, temporary clerk. Slavens, could you please uh, call the roll? Trustee Anthony. Present. Uh, Trustee Foster. Good evening. Trustee uh, Graham Hudak. Good evening. Um, Clerk Zegris is out at this point. Uh, Tre Treasurer Slavens is here. Uh, Trustee Snyderman. Uh, uh, excused absence this evening. And then um, Supervisor Williams. Hello. Uh, very good, thank you. Uh, call for a motion to adopt the agenda with the amendment to the temporary clerk. So, um, so moved. Second. Those in favor of the motion is presented. State aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, we, um, this evening, we have two items on the agenda. One is to review the 2019 budget adjustments, uh, budget final review, as well as the second item uh, to review the 2020 preliminary budget summary, preliminary budget detail. Turn it over to you, Wendy, kick us off. Thank you very much. Um, first, I wanna thank uh, Carolyn Cox, who's sitting here to my right, for all her hard work in preparing this budget. Um, a lot of work and a lot of time goes into this process. For the 2020 budget, that process started in June to get all of the people costs up and running, and it, it's a lot of work. So I just wanna thank her, because she's really the brains behind that operation, and I do the talking. So I wanna thank her. Uh, so first I'm going to go through the changes in 2019. I'm going to go over them uh, as quickly as I can to move on to 2020 because uh, you guys have all seen already the 2019 budget from back last November when we met on this originally. So uh, I'm going to start here with the general fund. Well, actually, this is all the differences. So if you look at the first column, this is what we projected to use if it was negative, a fund balance, or add to if it was positive when we first spoke last November. And this is the updated amount is the second column on what we're projecting to use or add to fund balance. And then the last column is the difference. So if you look at the general fund, the delta there is $931,000 um, to the positive. So we're not going to use as much fund balance as we initially uh, projected or were asking the board to use. That's primarily due to an increase in the property taxes of about $125,000. Uh, increase in the permit fees from where we initially had uh, asked the budget to be. Also, if you recall, there's a $250,000 transfer in from the roads that we're going to get back in 2019. We had to transfer that in 2018 to cover them so they're not in a deficit. We'll get that back in 2019, so that's a one-time thing. And also an increase in the state shared revenue by about $200,000. Overall, the expenses decreased by about $90,000. Uh, and then the, the one other thing in here that we briefly spoke about, I had sent an email about, was the fact that we are posting an IT manager position. Um, that total cost is about a fifteen dollars to $16,000 increase over the previously budgeted position of a network um, IT administrator. That is also included in this budget. But overall, for the general fund, we are adding, uh, excuse me, only using $1.9 million as opposed to the $2.8 million uh, as initially shown the board. Uh, the fire fund is using a little bit, um, well, they're adding to fund balance, but it's less than what we initially presented. It's going from $1.1 million to $999,000. It's due to a couple things. Um, if you recall, um, we applied for and received the SAFER grant, so we've got grant revenue in there. Um, but we also have the addition of six firefighters in there, so the expenses increased by about $700,000. That was offset by uh, about $338,000 of grant revenue and additional property tax revenue. The taxes are coming in higher than, than we had initially projected as well. The police fund is um, projecting now to use fund balance of just over a million dollars as opposed to $973,000, so about a $60,000 um, additional use of fund balance. Again, there was four positions that were added to the budget for full-time uh, police officers, and that came to about a, that with their fringes to about a $600,000 additional use of fund balance. However, a big chunk of that was offset by the growth in property taxes as well. So a lot of that is offsetting. 
community center fund went the positive way. So initially they're going to use $31,000 of fund balance. Now they're going to add to fund balance of about $130,000. Um, cable, if you go two down, they are budgeting to not add as much to fund balance uh, by $90,000. That is due to a capital purchase they are using with the PEG fees. So we get money that is restricted to be used for capital. That's what we're using it for. So I, I believe that might be for some studio recording equipment. Uh, the DDA is um, decreased a little bit, going from an 817,000 addition to 295,000. That's due to the library pulling out. We're no longer capturing the library taxes as well as some additional repair and maintenance. Uh, 911 service, we budgeted to use fund balance of about $1.3 million, and now it's to $2.1 million. That's due to some additional capital needs as well. Um, going down a few more lines, you look at the roads at about $3.1 million use uh, to the negative of the capital project roads. Um, that is where we are paving Ridge Road. So the expenses for Ridge Road are expected to happen in 19, and that's where um, that is being expensed. The golf course fund uh, is uh, going to do a little bit better, $133,000 better. Uh, the water and sewer fund also is looking to add um, and a little bit po more positive as well. And then the fleet maintenance fund is using a little bit more fund balance as well for about $119,000. And that has to do with some of the parking lot construction. Is there any changes or is there any questions on those changes? Okay, so the next item is the capital project um, summary listing, and I want to touch briefly on, um, you're all aware that we, have a, we had a CIP study done by um, consultants that helped us try to get our CIP plan moving forward. They um, passed off the project to us. They had gone through a number of spreadsheets, basically gone through all of our facilities, all of our parks, and identified a bunch of capital needs. Now that they've done all of that work, which has been helpful, we have a number of staff people involved in helping prioritize all those and get them into a usable format for budgeting purposes. So um, these are the capital projects that we are planning to do for 2019. When we get to 2020, you'll see um, we have an initial listing. We are expecting that that is going to change as a result of completing this review internally with staff. At the end of December is our plan on that. But all the green highlighted items up here are items that have changed since initially um, coming to the board. So you can see um, for parks, the first one of the heritage ball field safety nets, that's actually moving out of this line item into a different one, so it's not really gone. It looks like it's, it's just kind of moved uh, from where it was initially budgeted. Um, refreshing one of the restrooms at the sports center decreased a little bit. Uh, the Canton Sports Center, we've also uh, eliminated the carpet and ceiling tiles. Uh, we added some some work at the summit, the Maple Oaks divider wall, and some PA system. Uh, we, excuse me, we took off the divider wall. We added the facility PA system. Um, changed the ADA transition plan amount. Uh, the emergency response building signage was coming in, I believe, less than uh, initially anticipated. There's a project at the Human Services Building that Leisure Services could speak with if you have questions on that. On the right side of the screen, the machinery and equipment. We need some copiers at the Summit Sports Center and the, um, looks like we have that in two different places in the recreation budget and the and CLS budget, so they must need two copiers there. We have some vehicles that we're replacing uh, and then a scanner at the Human Resources. On this screen, um, emergency management has a couple items that are needed as well. IT has a significant amount of changes. The majority of those changes, um, they were able to work in in conjunction with the upgrading of the phone system. So some of these changes already happened, so that's why there's a significant amount of those decreased um, and some changes in the final. The most significant for IT, the annual workstation replacements, there is an upcoming known change where we are required to have all of our old computers upgraded by 2020 to account for a Windows change that's coming, and we have some very old computers there. So we um, decreased a lot of those IT line items and added more computers to get those up to date. Um, again, the studio recording equipment I just spoke of a minute ago on the cable fund is $90,000. We're using peg fees for that. Um, there's some iPads needed for Pheasant Run, the Ridge Road paving on the right side, also the $300,000 for the Wayne County um, initiative that we just got the IGA for. Um, 
few lines down, the permits and design for $42,000 under community improvement. That's the design work for the parking lot at Ridge and Cherry Hill on our property there. That got moved from 18, it's not gonna be done, we moved it from 18 into 19. Uh, <coughs> and then we made a slight change to the um, IGA or the Heritage Park improvements. The first item that I talked about on the previous slide was at $30,000 uh, for, the, for the field netting. It, that's part of that IGA program here on this slide. So in total, the um, initial capital was 2.8 million that the board saw. Now it's 6.4 million. In total, that difference is 3.58 million dollars. Um, 3.52 million of that is related to the roads. Uh, $90,000 of that was re uh, related to the studio equipment that is being funded by PEG fees and 42,000 was deferred from 2018. So all in all, it's actually, if you take out all the IT items, it's actually less than you had, initial, had initially seen before with the exception of the road projects and the one that is funded by PEG fees. Any questions on those? I have one on $50,000 for the Human Services Building. I don't know if that's Brad or Greg. The, can you remind me, is that carpeting? Is that heating, cooling? Is that roofing? Human Services Building, 50000 So um, Brad can touch on a little bit of the specifics, but I was just confirming on that project. We did apply to CDBG, and we were awarded the full $50,000 for that. Um, 2019 good project. Okay. So we just found out about that recently. But Brad can talk about some of the specific. Yeah, that's us. What, what were we going to do exactly? Yeah, so we're looking at fixing the soffit, the building soffit, the building roof, and then a lot of access control for security. Okay. Those are some of the main items we're looking at. Very good. Okay. So should we remove that for the 2019? With the grant? Okay. Yeah, we can. It's official. Okay. Does it, the Ridge Road paving includes the Wayne County monies also, correct, or? That 3.1 million includes the 1.5, 1.9 1 .9 million dollars. We have collected, we have billed that revenue for 2018. We have yet to receive it, but um, we have billed that in 2018. So the total project is expected to be 3.1 million dollars-ish. At the meeting Tim had a couple weeks ago with Wayne County, they were reminded that that invoice was due to be paid. Friendly. Any other questions on the capital? Okay, um, this is the public safety capital. So that was all of the general funded, general fund funded capital items. This is the public safety items um, that I believe um, Director Meyer has spoken at the previous strategic planning session about the changes that were coming up. Uh, the green highlighted items are the known changes. Um, I can walk through them. The, I don't know, Director Meyer, if you have anything to add to it or if there's any questions on them. But the EMS side of things uh, are just required, um, like the King Vision for ALS vehicles. That's a requirement for protocol change. Uh, it's an innovation tool. Um, the, the Zoll Heart Monitor is uh, now that we've got the new heavy rescue in service that allows us, the old heavy rescue, we had no storage ability for ALS equipment. Now that we have the new one, we're able to turn that into an advanced life support unit as well, but it needs a cardiac monitor. So uh, most of that stuff I think we covered in the um, strategic plan study session, uh, but happy to answer any questions. See none. Okay, so um, I actually already touched on these items when I started the uh, capital. We know the Ridge Road construction is coming, uh, and we've got the capital improvement plan that we're expecting the 2020 specifically to change, and we will bring that forward to you when we come to completion on that project as well. Um, so here's the um, proposed revenues by fund. So this shows the actual revenues for the previous, well, 15 through 17, we've got the budgeted revenue for 18. This is, again, the budgeted revenue, not where I think we're actually gonna end up for 18. And then the proposed revenue for 2019. I'm gonna focus on um, the changes between 2018 and 2019 and um, touch on those very quickly because we did talk about these already. Um, general fund revenue between 18 and 19 is uh, up approximately $586,000. 
Again, that is property taxes of about $400,000. Uh, we've got state shared revenue up, <clears throat> excuse me, about $100,000. Uh, however, that uh, licenses and permits is down about $250,000 from 2018's revenue. And the fire fund, we are up by about $1.2 million of revenue. That's property taxes increasing by about $800,000 and the federal grants of $338,000. Police fund, uh, we, I'm sorry, I jumped right over the roads fund. Roads fund went from $1 million to $6.8 million. That's the property taxes that we are collecting plus the uh, million dollars that we are expecting from the county uh, or part of that project as well. Police fund is up about $1.3 million. Property taxes as the result of $1.1 million and there is a transfer in from 911 of $300,000 there. Community center fund is pretty consistent. It's up a little bit. Um, it's really due to a transfer from the general fund is really the majority of that reason for that increasing. Uh, street lighting fund is pretty consistent, as is cable TV. Community improvement fund is dropping by about $3 million. That's due to a decrease in the transfer in from general fund. If you recall, we transferred, as a result of the positive fiscal year of 2017, we transferred $3 million into, as a placeholder for the known upcoming capital needs that we had. So um, that's just because we did not transfer, we're not budgeting the transfer in as much money from the general fund. Uh, continuing to go down, uh, the DDA is fairly consistent. The 911 um, service fund is pretty consistent. Really, until you go all the way down uh, to the, the, let's see, the golf course fund is the next one I really wanted to talk about. Uh, the golf course is uh, decreasing about $100,000. That's just due to a decrease of the transfer from the general fund to offset that. Uh, water and sewer fund, the revenue is going down here. That's as a result of the uh, actual water purchases and sewer purchases expenses expecting to be lower because of going to Yucca and the water tower. So we're just, I know this is the revenue side, but we won't collect the revenue if we're not, if we don't have the bills. Um, and really that's all I was gonna touch on on the revenue side, unless there was questions. On the expense side, um, the general fund expenses are down about $3.5 million. Uh, of that, wages and salaries are actually up about 1% or about $110,000. Uh, fringe benefits are up about 5.8% or $259,000. Capital outlay is down $840,000, but again, the biggest decrease is that transfers out from the general fund. We saw that transfer in, in um, 2018 and community improvement fund that I just spoke about the transfer out is would have been the offsetting here for general fund so that's the primary difference there the fire fund expenses are up about four hundred and thirty one thousand um, dollars that's due to the salaries wages and fringes are up by about 1.4 million dollars because of the uh, new firefighters and some of the dispatchers are moving from police to fire but the capital is down about a million dollars uh, the police fund is up about $2.2 .2 million. Of that, $1.8 million is represented by uh, salaries, wages, and fringes. Um, but the capital, and the, also the capital is up about $600,000 as well. Uh, the community center fund is up slightly. Again, wages and salaries are about $52,000 of that, and the capital is $45,000 of that. Um, going down the line, uh, community improvement, if you go down a few lines, uh, is actually pretty consistent. So the capital that we're spending in 19 is pretty consistent with 18. Uh, the DDA uh, costs have gone down slightly um, just for some of the uh, repairs and maintenance there. Uh, and also the bond payment, I believe, is done in 2018. The 911 service fund, the expenses are up. That's due to the capital that we've talked about in the past uh, on the capital slide. Continuing to go down to fund 403, the roads fund, that's the Ridge Road project. Uh, and then going further down, um, really the next big one is the water and sewer fund. You can see the expenses are budgeted to decrease significantly from 2018 to 2019. And again, that's because of the purchases we just spoke about. Uh, and then the post-employment benefits fund is really the only other significant decrease. Uh, and that is due to, if you recall in 2018, we contributed about three 
$1 million into our OPEB fund because of the positive year that we had, uh, we're only we're going back to budgeting the $1 million. If our years end up positive, we will continue to monitor that and contribute excess into that fund should we um, be able to at that point in time. Uh, really, the only other big difference there is at the very last line item, the special assessment debt service. Um, it, in 2018, we had 1.2 million. In 2019, we had 159,000. If you recall, that's where we transferred money to help offset the Ridge Road costs because we had money available in that fund. Any questions there? Um, for Tim, related to the water. So I was at a meeting with um, some other communities recently and they shared the opinion that Canton was below the targets on the total water buy. Does that make any sense to you or are you familiar with that or is that just a vicious rumor? Yeah, they, were, they, they must have attended some GLIWA meeting and somebody must have said something. Because my concern is not for this year, it's gonna be for what happens next year if we don't meet our targets, right? And I know you're just beginning to think about scheduling well, this year's this year's water consumption will drive next year's rates, um, and this year's water consumption is pretty much on track with what uh, we had projected at 2.55 billion gallons. Perfect. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. Just confirmation. Okay. okay this next slide is going to show where our fund balance is projected to be with the budget that we're asking the board to adopt. So, the 2018 proposed fund balance is based on the budget that the board has adopted, the amended budget. So that first column, that 2018 proposed fund balance, is going to change based on the actual results. But we do not believe it's going to change to the negative. We believe it's going to change to the positive. So this is kind of the worst case scenario at this point in time. At the end of the day, if you take the previous year's fund balance, add the revenues, subtract the expenses, the general fund would end up with a fund balance at the end of the year at about $9.1 million. And I'm really just going to focus on the top three um, the general fund would be 9.1, the fire fund is going to be at about $8 million, and the police fund at about $6.5 million. Um, that gives us a fund balance percentage for the general fund of about 31%, the police fund of about 29%. Um, so those are healthy fund balances. Remember, our board um, wants a 15% fund balance level. The fire fund has a very large fund balance percentage here, and that's 52%, and we are aware of that. We have a big cost coming up for the fire station build, which is gonna go down. That is not in the budget right now, and we're expecting that to go back down to, you know, normal level, hopefully higher than the 15% level, but we know we're gonna use some fund balance there, so um, it's a little bit escalated right now. Any questions there? Okay, I'm gonna go quickly over um, a couple items, just a couple of the assumptions for the 2020 budget for you to keep in mind as the different departments go over their budgets. For 2020, the property tax revenue inflation factor has come out by the state. The state has issued that, so it's 2.4% is the inflation factor for 2020's property taxes coming out, so that's pretty positive. With that and the new construction, we are estimating a revenue to increase about 3.8%, so we can go up by inflation, plus the new ads. So we're budgeting about a 3.8% uh, inflation in the revenue for 2020 for property taxes. State shared revenue, um, we conservatively estimate that because the state doesn't announce the budget figures and obviously that's actually based on actual sales tax that is collected. But we budgeted that to be about 2% higher than what the state has budgeted it to be for 2019. Uh, the other revenues have been based on prior year revenues and estimates of um, future permits, and I'm sure uh, Tim will get into that when he speaks on his uh, presentation as well. Uh, the largest expense, obviously, that we have in the township is capital and people. So um, the people costs, we, unless there's a contract um, already that's going into 2020, and I don't believe any of our contracts go into 2020, we have used a 2% um, employee wage increase. Now that's subject to union negotiations, that can change, but just for budgeting purposes, we put, we put in a 2%. Inflation's at 2.4%, so we're trying to keep it semi in line with inflation. Uh, pension costs, we know are going up. They've been going up about 10% per year. We are aware that the experience study for MERS is coming out, which means 
how long are people living, how is the market doing. Um, they have already said that their interest rate that they are using in their actuarial valuations is going to decrease. And if the interest rate decreases, our costs increase. Perfect. So a 10% increase may be even on the light side, um, but we're gonna continue to monitor that and use 10% at this point in time. We have medical costs in there as well at a 10% increase. Um, nobody is very comfortable telling us what the medical costs are gonna go in at. My sense is that pension costs are gonna come in a little bit higher than that and medical are gonna come in a little bit lower than that. So I think at the end they will offset each other and, we'll, and they'll balance each other out. OPEB funding, we have estimated that for current retirees, the medical costs are gonna increase about 9%. And as I spoke earlier, that the pre-funding of OPEB, we added about a million dollars, not about, we added a million dollars um, to allocate that for pre-funding. What's the total of our current retirees? How many in that account? I'd have, to, I'd have to look into that for you. I can get you that answer. I might be able to get you that answer while we're sitting here. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Where would this be shown, Bill, on this? I'm trying to figure out. So the OPEB funding. The OPEB is in um, 736. 736. Okay, post-employment. Yep. And these are all under the new chart of account numbers? Nope. Oh, okay. thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Um, the state. <laughs> the Sorry state, I asked. <laughs> okay. Um, brought, rolled out a new chart of accounts in which every municipality is required to um, follow. So about every 10 years, 10, 15 years, the state says there's too many there's too many accounts, you need to reduce the number of accounts, and so you reduce them, and then they say, we don't like that anymore, you gotta expand them and change all the numbering again. So this numbering is based on what the board has traditionally seen. The board, the budget that is adopted by the board, the fund numbers are gonna be a little bit different. The amounts are gonna be the same, but the fund numbers and everything are gonna be different. The state just does that to keep us busy. Okay, so, so the 621 is what our balance is right now with our legacy costs then, or? Oh, no. That's the fund balance of that fund. Um, you're looking at the 621,000? Yes. That's, what, that's the fund balance that we're projecting to be within our fund that we pay our medical costs out of. The money that we have invested and is offsite and that is not recorded on our financial statements. Okay. And that's in a trust that we cannot access, so that's not on our financial statements. If you were to pull out our audit, it's in the notes to the, to the audit of the financial statements, but it's not. It's not our cash, it's cash that's held on behalf of our employees, so it's not on our books. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, well next up is public safety. Oops. Public safety, so let me switch this over and I've got a wireless for you. Back up. Oh, okay. Just loose. That's nice. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, most of what we're going to talk about tonight was presented, or, or a lot of the information we're going to talk about tonight was presented in our uh, strategic plan study session that we had a few weeks ago with the board. So uh, we'll try to go through it as quickly as we can in fairness to my colleagues who still have to go tonight. Um, but we're happy to answer any questions. So with me tonight presenting, um, to my right, Deputy Director Stockline with the Fire Department, Deputy Chief Strasner, and then Deputy Director Baugh from the Police Department, Deputy Chief Wilshire. Uh, we'll all be presenting, and then Barb Caruso, uh, my executive assistant in the back, is responsible for the PowerPoint. So the, when every year, when we get to budget time, we have the same process. It's been the same process for many years. And what we do on both, both sides of the house, police, fire, and emergency management, is we submit um, what we have. We have a form that gets sent out to our, our command officers. The command officers will take that form. Uh, they'll go through, because each one of our command officers on the fire side, police side, all have auxiliary duties and responsibilities that they're responsible for. So they'll go through their areas of the budget, um, and they'll look to see if there's any increases, decreases needed. Uh, they submit those budget requests up to the deputy chiefs. The deputy chiefs review them. 
Uh, once they're okay, they sign off. It goes to the deputy director, then to me, and then we'll all meet with both deputy directors. We'll go through all those budget requests uh, together, make a decision, um, and then we'll have a uh, dialogue with the finance director. Once we, uh, once I'm comfortable that, that those items are needed, we send that to the finance director who has a review, the township supervisor, and then ultimately tonight to the board of trustees. So some changes for the 2020 budget. Uh, for public safety staffing, you can see we're adding police officers to the police department. Uh, that is four police, uh, police officers are actually being added in 2019, so it brings our staffing up in 2020 to 96. Uh, we'll again review that um, later in 2019 based off the numbers and, and see what that looks like. Uh, 74 firefighter paramedics in the fire department, uh, 18 support staff, five ordinance officers, eight public safety service officers, dispatchers, and then our six public safety aides. And that's the new position. Um, we always like to, to look at where we're at in comparison to comparable fire departments and police departments. <coughs> One thing we learn every year that we do this is that there's a multitude of other ways that communities do their budgets. Uh, so when we look at some of the cities, some of the city budgets uh, versus township, we have a special millage um, versus a city. Uh, sometimes they're not reporting capital because those are in separate accounts. They're not reporting millages. So some of the numbers are a little bit off. Um, for example, Livonia, we know that that is a little bit under because their capital isn't included in that number. Um, but what's important that we look at is our cost per capita. And right now, Canton stands at $166.83 cost per capita. Uh, the average of all those comparable communities are $203.72. Um, the... So we take a look at that. We also look at the um, type of service that's provided in, in the coverage area. And then you can see total sworn uh, the average is 1.3 per 1,000 with can being at 0.72. Uh, same on the police side, uh, operating cost per capita for the police department is $222. When we look at some of the comparable communities, um, you can see uh, the difference there, the average being 251, and then the Southeast Michigan Council on Government average being at 304. Sure. This will come in, this will be important later when Deputy Chief Wilshire kind of looks at those same com communities and their crime rates, and I think the board has seen that as well in the past. Um, we're always looking in the Public Safety Department to leverage grant money and try to find extra dollars where we can. So these are some of the grants that we go after on an annual basis. Uh, the assistance to firefighter, that's a federal grant, FEMA grant. So far, we've been uh, successful in acquiring about 1.1 million, a little over 1.1 million uh, in grant dollars to purchase equipment, much needed equipment for the fire department. Uh, on the police department side, we utilize forfeiture funds. Forfeiture funds are those funds that we seize um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, once the case is adjudicated, that becomes forfeited funds and we can utilize that for police equipment. It's very specific. Uh, very specific in what we can what we can purchase with those dollars, um, and we have to follow the federal guidelines. The USC grant dollars, three hundred and twenty-two dollars. That's a county grant that comes in through the federal government. It's distributed through the counties. Um, we've been successful in purchasing things such as our EOC and radio equipment. It's got to be. Um, it's a little restrictive in that it's got to be grants that would be for the greater good of the county or the region. So we try to utilize like our emergency operations center, communications type stuff. Uh, Michigan Municipal Risk Management, we take advantage of the RAP grants, $97,000 year to date, body cameras, push bumpers, school training, you name it, we're trying to get grant money for it. Uh, the JAG grants, 87, and then of course, sometimes we get some private donations through uh, businesses in the community. Um, some of the considerations um, that we're looking at in 2020, uh, we have the SAFER grant that, that takes effect this year. That's a three-year grant. We're going to reapply for that um, in the future to try to add to that. Um, the cardiac monitors that were purchased several years ago with grant money, those are at the life cycle already. It seems like it was just yesterday, um, but they have a five to seven year life cycle. So we're reapplying to replace those, those monitors next in 2020. Uh, with FEMA grant money. And then on the police department, again, we're gonna look at the forfeiture and the COPS grants. COPS grants had sometimes, it was similar to SAFER where you could apply for police officer positions. Um, but the difference is where on the, on the SAFER grant, they tell you that it has to be a firefighter position. Um, 
on the COPS grant, they're usually very specific to what that police officer can do, and historically it's been school resource officers. So if you hire a police officer on a COPS grant, you have to assign that officer to being a school resource officer. So it hasn't, um, you know, we've, we've looked at it, and um, last year we, we looked, I think it was last year? Yeah, right. last year we looked at it, and we thought, well, maybe we can apply and, and pay for one of our existing school resource officers, and you can't do that under the grant guidelines. It has to be a new position. Mm -hmm. So, But we'll keep looking and continue to utilize that where we can. The next slide. Uh, those are the indirect costs. Uh, those are the indirect costs that come out of our fund and back into the general fund to pay for other items across the township. Um, and that's just a 10 year history of those. Now if we break the, um, as Wendy said, most of just like the general fund across the township, most of our uh, funds are, are split between salaries and fringe benefits. Um, so you can see there, 49% and 30% 30, 30 respectively of the fire department budget is split between salaries and fringe benefits, uh, leaving 12% to the next pie. And then when you break that down, that's where the rest of that money goes. So if you look at just the operating costs of the fire department, that's for equipment, things like that, not non-capital type stuff, is 35% of our budget. On the police side, same story. Uh, fringe benefits, salaries account for the, the, the majority of our budget. Um, we go to the next. Uh, we have a significant, uh, the difference between the police department and fire department is our liability insurance is much higher uh, on the police department side than it is on the fire department side. We do sometimes get some of that money back at the end of the year. Um, our fleet costs are, are higher on the police department side because we have more vehicles. And then uh, some things like prisoner care, those are, those are some uncontrollable expenses. Um, but the actual operating cost for the police department it accounts for about 18% of our budget. And I'll turn it over to the Deputy Chief. Mr. Astor. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so for the fire side of things, we're going to talk about uh, the EMS cost recovery on this first slide. And uh, what we're showing is that we're going to have a increase, uh, which will definitely offset our operational costs associated with providing advanced life support services, just like that slide says. Uh, the good part with that is that uh, the call volume is going up, right? That's a good thing, uh, as we can keep maintaining the advanced life support services that we're providing. We're really staying on top of this, though, as far as what Medicare is able to provide, because those rules are constantly changing. So there's fluctuations. And there's a few other uh, areas, um, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but QWAP is a uh, tax that uh, the, the government is actually putting on local jurisdictions to provide medical services. So we're constantly looking at that to be sure that we're staying on top of it. But the good part for us is the call volume is going up and uh, we'll obviously have an increased revenue. And that's tied to earlier in the year when we came to the board and uh, maybe that was even last year when we increased what we were charging for ambulance services. So that's shown in this slide. Uh, so the fire department staffing, um, currently we're at 68. Um, we're looking to move to 74 as we've already discussed. And uh, the last part of this slide talks about the NFPA Midwest average where other fire agencies have 1.43 uh, firefighters per 1,000 per population. Uh, that part of that slide is there just to show kind of like how we're uh, working around that system to be sure that we're delivering the best possible service that we can with just the right number of staffing. And uh, as the next couple slides go to show, I think you'll see that the call volume that we're experiencing continues to increase. Uh, in 15 and 16, we were pretty, we were pretty uh, even, but over 17 and what we're projecting for for 18, that's a significant increase to keep the manpower at the same levels that, it, that they're at. So uh, that's why we are uh, making this increase to uh, make us be at 74. Uh, for the next slide, we're talking about EMS and patient contact uh, calls for service comparison. I think this slide is important because although we say how many calls for service we actually have in a year, uh, it really doesn't, really doesn't show like how many people we're actually talking to. Uh, there's many calls and we don't do it like uh, some agencies where they'll make a, a, a 
uh, they'll pull a run number for everybody they talk to. That kind of inflates really uh, your service. If we go on a car accident and there's five people there, well, that's just one run number. But a lot of agencies don't do that. But we still like to track that number, though, because we want to be sure, hey, how many people are, are, are firefighters talking to? You know, how many people are they treating? It's just a, it, it's a good comparison to, to show. And as you can see, though, those are steadily increasing. All right, this is the relatively, uh, probably one of the, the more <coughs> important slides that I have for this evening, and this is the mutual aid requested. So this is when uh, our services become overrun and we uh, you know, are all helping other um, citizens and then the, that third, fourth, and fifth call comes in. We can't handle it, so we have to call for mutual aid. It's really uh, not really what mutual aid was designed for. I mean, it was designed for uh, major incidents, but as you can see, in 15 and 16, we requested mutual aid to come to Canton 87 and 89 times. In 17, we saw a reduction because we kind of observed these numbers and said, we're going to have to change how we're operating here. So we began breaking down trucks and putting more people in ambulances to take care of uh, the call volume, which is a good thing. Uh, but in 18, even those uh, even, even those operational decisions weren't working, right? So we're, we're right back to kind of where we were uh, at 98. And I think it's indicative just of just seeing that call volume increase as much as it has. Uh, average response time. Okay, this one's super important as well. Um, we're looking at the average response time over the last uh, three years, mm -hmm. oh, four years if you're counting 18. Uh, what's, good about, what's good about this slide is this uh, is showing from the time it takes someone to pick up a phone and for the fire department to arrive on scene and begin mit mitigating whatever emergency is happening, these are the times that you're getting. So in 15, as you can see, uh, the fire average response time is a little bit higher than the EMS average response time. And that's basically because uh, we allow the firefighters a little bit more time to put gear on, of course, you know, to get on the truck. But as you can see, though, there's, as the call volume increases, as we get busier, uh, so does the average response time. Our plan for mitigating this type of situation, though, is again to embrace technology. Uh, there is just so many things out there from AVLs, automatic vehicle locators, to the status boards that we just recently put in the stations that are alerting the firefighters even before dispatch has the chance to push the button and announce what information it is because it happens simultaneously. So we're very excited about some of the technological changes that we're making. Uh, it's just, we just have time to get it done. That's the issue, right? So, all right. Uh, so I'll just touch on the, uh, the overview of the expenditures. Uh, we increase the overtime. Uh, we know that with the manpower going up, there's gonna be uh, more people um, staffing the stations also could be incurred um, from overtime, um, from sick use or PTO, times like that. So we know that with the increased manpower um, that there's gonna be an increase in overtime costs as well. So we can try to keep that as minimal as possible. Um, some of our operating expenses, you can see we increased 46,000 for 2020 and 25,000 of that uh, has to do with the offset from that EMS billing that, we, that the deputy chief was talking about. So as we collect from that, we also pay a company to um, administer that and, and collect those fees for us. Um, $10,000 on our um, attorney. Um, he'll be pro providing training and guidance uh, for uh, both police and fire. Uh, ESO software, 2500, that is our uh, reporting software for our EMS. Um, so as we continue to um, upgrade that system, like you said, the technology, um, that's, that's part of the expense. Employee medical exams. Um, obviously speak for themselves, Clemis is our uh, CAD reporting system. Um, that's mandatory fee from Clemis out of Oakland County. And then the other ones, the other 5,800 is spread among the um, other accounts, expense accounts. Um, accounts set by the township, uh, 31,440. Um, we don't have any say in that. And then the maintenance and repair accounts, 4,700 decrease from the 19, and utilities will be a 3,500 uh, increase. Uh, capital outlay. Uh, like the deputy chief said, uh, tablets for apparatus. Um, that's the technology that'll get the mapping into the, um, the rigs for us, um, as well as the training computers, um, NFPA, MIOSHA, all those, uh, those uh, organizations are requiring us to do more and more training. So 
these, these computers and help us get that training uh, completed. Um, gas monitors, you'll see the $10,000 there. Those monitors uh, get outdated. Um, we're gonna replace five of those in 2020, um, as well as the uh, PPE, which is personal protection equipment. That's for our turnout gear. Um, we don't have a um, extricator and um, dryer currently in the stations and with the new Cancer Presumption Act, all those things that are going in effect, we want to make sure that we get that gear cleaned for the firefighters uh, when they return from those runs. Uh, future considerations. Um, one of our biggest things is uh, recruiting higher retention. You can see that uh, we're trying to add those um, firefighters this year on the Safer Grant uh, 19. And it's obviously an issue to continue to um, grow our department. There's not many um, people in the field that are continuing to look for this this type of career. So our retention is big. We put a lot of effort into that. And our recruiting, uh, we're working on, on new programs to uh, get into the high school and so forth and, and get young young minds uh, started on the skilled trades here early, early in their life. Um, so we'll continue to hit at home with that. Um, you can see our run volume continues to increase. Uh, the MIOSHA standards, the NFPA standards, all these things continue to um, knock on our door. Um, so that's why we're asking for a training officer as well in the future. Um, we know that we'll have to, you know, it's myself and the deputy chief running, running the entire department there. Um, we know that we're, as we continue to add all of these things, um, training is gonna be one of the bigger things that we have to. Uh, just last year, we had that uh, incident with the SEAL and um, we had a MIOSHA come in here um, and we, Pass that with flying colors, right? And that's because we kept track, track of our training and we did the proper things and we were able to show them that, that that's what we're doing. Um, as we grow, we have to make sure that we can continue to, to provide that um, and answer to any, any organization that comes in here for us. I think it's also important to point out that Public Act 291 recently changed and Public Act 291 is the, the, the act that governs firefighter training. With that change, there's re more required training and more required documentation standards. And so what once was able to be managed by a battalion chief who could, who could manage that and do his day-to-day -day operation is no longer manageable for him to do that on his own and, and try to run a shift. So we're now having to pay a battalion chief overtime to come in and do some of these things and try to keep up with it and track the training and make sure we're compliant with the public act. Okay, so it's another unfunded liability? I think you could call that an unfunded mandate. Okay. Yeah. Good. It's good. The, ch the training component and the changes to Public Act 291 were important and they were much needed. The Public Act was done in the 1960s, so you can you can only imagine how much firefighting has evolved from 1960 to today. The, when the when the Public Act was written, firefighters weren't doing EM, you know in some cases weren't doing EMS. They weren't doing the hazardous materials. They weren't doing weapons of mass destruction. They weren't doing all the things that they're required to do today. So the change was much needed. The problem becomes is how do you manage that change? And now all these fire departments are now going to be required to meet those standards and make sure that their firefighters are trained and who's going to pay for it. So let's put a pin in it for next week and maybe have Kristen Cole because we're developing a theme in different areas with recently changed legislation that says go do it, but you figure out how to pay for it. And there is a small amount of money available through the Firefighter Training Council for fireworks funds, and we, we do go after that money. As a matter of fact, I sit on that board. So um, I think last year we brought in close to, you know, $15,000 from that. But, to help I mean, offset. But that's spread throughout the entire county, downriver and Detroit, and you're talking about $200,000 split between all of those cities. So it really comes to nothing. <laughs> Um, so with that, the training facility, as we mentioned um, in our um, strategic plan, um, we'll be looking at that as well. Uh, fire prevention um, and administrative support, we know that um, we're continuing to build in the township. We need to continue to add uh, support to that division to make sure that um, they have the ability to inspect all of these businesses to get out there on the new construction, make sure that things are being built properly so that we're not responding to fires. Um, and also with that, um, we know we currently inspect um, businesses about once every five years in the township. Um, we know that we need to get into those businesses more often to make the community safe. Um, the, the businesses that are high hazards, we usually get in there about once a year. Uh, we do get in there once a year. Um, but um, those, some of those other businesses, um, you know, we just can't hit every single business with two inspectors. Um, so that, that's why we have fire prevention on there as well. Um, like the deputy chief said, the AVLs, automatic vehicle locators, that will help with our response times. Um, 
knowing where the vehicles are at, we can always send the closest vehicle to the alarm or to the uh, medical response um, and to make sure that we're gonna get the best response times with the available units that we have. And finally, Fire Station 4. Um, you saw on that list of our comparables, we're the only um, township or city with three fire stations. Everybody else has got four or five, six fire stations, um, anybody in our size and population. Um, so we know that we're running um, way behind, and that also affects our response time. So that's definitely one thing that we'll be considering um, in the future. And you guys have all seen this slide. Um, this was our response times with a Station 4 at Michigan Avenue and uh, Lilly. Um, so you can see with the red there, or the orange, whatever you want to call it, 10-minute uh, response times. And by adding the Station 4 on the right there where that red dot's at, um, that gets rid of all the 10 minute plus response times um, in our jurisdiction. Now, obviously, um, that goes to per se, you know, units are in the station, we're not out on all the runs, but you can see what a dramatic difference a, a fourth station will make to the response times for the uh, citizens of the community. Are the response times, um, are, are were they still having issues with the trains at all in terms of decreasing response times? Has that gotten a lot better since the state? We had one issue. CSX police, uh, and within an hour, he called me back and had a resolution for it. Assured us it wasn't going to occur again. It was a it was an error in dispatching, um, but reported problems. We haven't had any since we had that meeting in Plymouth. Good. Other jurisdictions have, but can we have not? Okay. Good. Thanks. Wendy, I think I asked this every every year. Technology inside public safety vehicles, can that be funded by cable monies, the peg fees? Because it is, is it not? It's not for use for, it's not for use on uh, public Technology. television. Okay, all right, I'm stretching to the technology piece of it, but that's, it's gotta be part of public TV. Correct. Got it, thank you. If they wanna start a cop show, maybe we can, but. Josh, <laughs> starting Jamie. <laughs> the Deputy Chief Wilshire is going to kind of kick it off on the police department and go over um, some of the statistical stuff on the police department. Again, a lot of the things you heard at the last study session, and then uh, Deputy De Deputy Director Baugh that's a, will take over and talk about the money. So based on these numbers, you'll see why we will not get a cop show. Um, looking at how we rate, we're fourth among, among our comparables in the actual um, the, the uh, chart that we showed earlier when we broke down the cost of the public safety department, the police department. We haven't had any homicides this year, correct? Uh, we, we rank number fourth among our, uh, number four among our, our comparables. We're actually 1.3 in violent crimes and then one or 12.7 uh, in our property crimes, which are below the average of all those jurisdictions that are included in here. So we continue to pride ourselves on being a very safe community and that's due to the work that our police officers do on the, on the road. Uh, as, we, as we work to continue that safe community, we evaluate the staffing in order to provide adequate service to the, the community. Uh, looking at staffing levels, uh, we'd like to look at the, uh, the number of officers on patrol. Uh, currently we have 92. Uh, in 2019 we anticipate adding uh, more bodies to go to, to 96. Um, however, that is below the, the standard that we want to use is the one per 1,000, which would give us actually 97 officers, um, which is well below the state average of 1.73 uh, per thousand, the national average of 2.2 per thousand, and then the SEMCOG average of 2.4, so which are all a little inflated when it, in our opinion. We can still probably, we can do a very good job with the one per 1,000, as you can see that we've continued to do that over the years. So why do you think that they're well, if you, you can you consider that Detroit, we had 2.4 officers per thousand, um, Southfield. that would put us at, at quite a high number, and, and that really wouldn't be uh, wouldn't we be able to uh, support that through our budget? But I mean, Leadership, ma'am. So you're just thinking they're, they're they say that they think that it should be that, and we're just saying we don't think we need that much. So. I, I, I think what, when you look at when you look at Canton's model versus some other models, you'll see. Um, uh, if we backed up the other slide, you'll see that 77% of our police officers are in the patrol division. Um, that's not always the case in other, in other jurisdictions. Our span of control, um, 
you know, the, the average band of control is five to seven officers per one command officer. We're well above that. Our detective bureau uh, at one point was 12, 12 to one. Um, so there's a, the other jurisdictions have a, a larger number of command officer positions compare, in comparison to what we have. We've eliminated a lot of command positions. Um, traffic enforcement, we're down to three traffic enforcement officers. At one point we had six. Um, so those, those changes over the years have brought us to where we are, but we feel um, it's something we're going to continue to monitor and, and uh, keep an eye on. And when I say inflated, this next slide will answer that question. Um, there's multiple studies that have been done. Um, currently, we have 48 officers on patrol. That doesn't include our 60 um, when we add our command staff in. But we are not planning on adding any command staff, but that's going to have to be a future consideration in order to uh, uh, even out the span of control between the officers. Our proposed for next year would go to 53 and 2019. Uh, and we looked at two studies. We looked at the MSU study, which, which showed that to do minimum police stat, police work, we'd have to have 59 officers. And then the Bartell study, which has been used in the past in order to tell us what our staffing level should be at, which would be 63. Uh, and the Bartell study is, is very similar to the MSU study in that it actually adds four officers just because as a padding in, in that study. So this is where we get that, that inflated number, that those 2.4, that, that would never, um, that these studies don't support that. And this is what we're following. Uh, if, if we look in uh, on the projected numbers for 2020, um, we'd be at 97 police officers, which would make us approximately 0.98, um, which would, again, get us very close to that one per 1,000, which we're, we're looking for. And as the community and population grows, so does, again, just like the fire department, our response times continue to grow, uh, as do our calls for service. Uh, and the total calls are going to, again, put a strain on our dispatch center and put a strain on our officers, which requires us to continue to add uh, staffing, which we will continue to evaluate year by year in order to determine what level and how many, uh, what the staffing levels will be to continue the service that the community deserves. As we look at our dispatch center activity, as we said, we're adding six PSAs. The six PSAs that we're adding will help alleviate some of the stress that, that's on this dispatch center. Because this dispatch center does not only support the police department, it also supports the fire department. So it had, they have split duties and, and they're very, you know, um, very highly trained dispatchers who, who are uh, multifaceted. As you, as you look, the, the number of total calls that come in have gone up uh, over the last couple of years to 147,000. The one thing that really impacts the dispatch centers are those arrests. Uh, they've gone up uh, to 4,500. That takes a dispatcher out of the dispatch center and somebody that's not in the dispatch center in order to answer the 911 calls, which are the most important to the community. That's where we get the PSAs who will help, uh, help with the, the prisoner processing and not remove a, a trained dispatcher from the dispatch center. And looking at the call breakdown, again, 17% of the calls that come in are 911 calls. PSAs can also help with these other administrative tasks so that, the, again, the trained dispatchers can focus on those 911 calls in order to service the community better. And I'll turn it over to Deputy Director Ball. All right. As you see, um, there's a $10,000 overtime increase in the 19 budget as we try to transform the police departments and progress with the requirements and the service levels expected of our citizens takes us out at odd hours and different times. And to do so, as you see with our lean service model, you're going to pay overtime to accomplish some of these tasks. So that's why you see the jump in the uh, overtime. You also see a $10,000 increase in ammunition. Now keep in mind, ammunition accounts for less lethal options. And we call less lethal options like bean bags and stuff like that to mitigate issues in a manner that doesn't ultimately de uh, really impact a person's life. Thank you. Um, and so that goes into that part of the budget too, and that's causes for the increase. Um, as you see with the account set up by the Township of Fleet, fleet Liability Insurance and Indirect Costs, there's a $200,000 increase there. The $7,000 maintenance and repair increase has to do with um, one issue was with the battery backup and dispatch. We, we need to ensure that the battery backup um, works when there's a power outage a few times. I believe the supervisor at least knows about where we had some uh, loss of service to our dispatch center because of the battery backup. And utilities at a $5,000 increase there includes uh, cell phone uh, bills. And we, we created an investigative element that's very responsive to patrol and the needs of the community. We paid for some cell phones. 
with that, there could be a decrease with that, and Wendy's been real helpful with this with Verizon and in the future potentially FirstNet, there could be a decrease in that cost. Um, looking at the capital items, the capital outlay, outlay with the computers, technology replacements in the car, there's $8,000 there. <laughs> That's important, just as you run in a lean police department, you need to have technology to uh, offset um, the officer's uh, time. So when you improve technology, you, you mitigate how, much, how many people you actually need out there. Um, new computers are normal replacements, printer replacements are normal, um, machinery and equipment. So we have taser replacements. There's a lifespan to a taser, it's five years, and that's just a part of our normal uh, reoccurring uh, replacement of tasers. Um, 12 vehicles total, so you'll see four new investigative vehicles. That special operations group at the bottom, SOGS, the team that we created, they're, they're sharing vehicles and they still will share in the future with these four, but they will um, free up some um, vehicles for them to actually use the work. Right now they, um, we're creating a spot in the building for them to actually have workspace, and with the four vehicles they'll actually have more dedicated vehicles to use. Right now we're sharing a lot of vehicles to account accomplish the task. Um, then the eight replacements are on schedule with Clark. Our uh, K-9 vehicle is well over 100,000 miles, I believe, at this point, correct? Yes. Right, so that's a normal replacement in 2020. Uh, future considerations, we have recruiting, hiring, retention issues, just like the fire department. It's a real competitive market out there. There's, everyone's hiring. Um, over the last few years, there's probably been a negative perception of police, so Maybe the candidate pool is not as deep as it used to be, so we're constantly looking and reaching out to all advocacy groups in, a, in our township to have a department that actually reflects the community. It's really challenging. And uh, I just encourage the board to ask us questions. If you have any concerns or thoughts about recruiting, hiring, and retention, we'd be glad to answer them. Uh, command, supervision, administrative position, that's a future consideration also. We'll ask, look to the board, I suspect, in the upcoming budgets. Um, we're at least a third to a half um, less in our comparable departments with our administrative positions, and that's where we can make cuts and uh, still provide a, uh, a good first response. But the span of control is increasing. We have requirements with CLIA, we have, which our accreditation response. We have to have um, people to handle all those tasks. Uh, technology enhancements are always constantly looking for how to improve our RMS systems, um, finding solutions to transfer data to the Wayne County Prosecutor's Offices, um, the local prosecutor, FOIA, different attorneys, the bill, always looking to improve that part of our um, function. Security enhancement, now back to CALEA, uh, our accreditation has certain requirements of us, so that's gonna um, probably uh, cause consideration for the board of a, probably a, a healthy increase or a, substantial look at how much it's going to cost to uh, improve the parking lot security front desk and lobby and the training facility we're looking for a joint training facility upgrade at our range with the fire department and also with the restoration of the uh, our public safety headquarters which we share with the fire department meaning our HVAC system carpet and walls and we have some uh, evidence here of how the carpet looks the buildings aging we have some um, as you see it's quite obvious uh, at least these eight pictures, there's the carpet needs to be upgraded. Um, we have a lot of traffic. We have people in and out uh, of the building constantly, and this carpet's been in place for some time. If you look up the ceiling tiles and the wallpaper, these are quite obvious. It's of a, a modern police agency in the western Wayne suburbs. I, I don't think you'd I think this is acceptable. Um, as you see, the, the, the countertops are, are need to be replaced. Uh, I don't know if there's a hole in the wall, but we have a hole in the wall. Um, but, so we need to fix that. That's not a bullet hole. <laughs> we have those elsewhere. Yes, that would be a... Uh, For the retention, do you find that that's, that's pretty standard across the country, correct? Retention? Well, to some degree, then there's it, it, a lot of it has to do, I think, number one, with the applicant pool is smaller. Then when it comes to a competitive package, we have to compete with different retirement systems that are offered by other agencies. And it, it's, it's an issue and it's, it's the truth. So that's the feedback we're getting. 
So before I jump into emergency management, I want to touch on a, on a couple of things. Um, we talked a little bit uh, to ask the question about the, the staffing and um, the, the inflation. And, and really, for us, what it boils down to is our response times are direct correlation to our staffing, and that's what we continuously monitor. And um, I say it often, I'll say it again at the end of the night, that the, ultimately the township board determines the service levels for Canton Township. Um, so as we, we've had a, a, over a four minute uh, increase in our average response time on the police side, uh, we've had an increase on the fire side. And so if we do nothing, that, run, that, that response time is gonna continue to climb. Um, and so what we're trying to do is take a reasonable and responsible approach to look at it and say, how many officers do we need to keep that service level where the board wants it, to keep that response time down, and to keep our residents um, getting the same public safety services that they've grown to, to uh, see in the past. Um, so emergency management, um, not a lot of changes. Again, um, we've applied for the grant, we've, we've gotten the grant, so 50% of uh, Will Hayes, our new emergency manager's salary will be covered uh, with federal grant dollars. Um, we don't, we don't have any idea how long that will be around for or how long they'll continue that, but we'll continue to apply for it year after year as long as it's offered. Uh, there is no overtime or capital expenses uh, projected in 2020. We did upgrade the siren system, so now it's just a matter of maintaining it. We've budgeted 15,000. We're hopefully optimistic that it will come in quite a bit under that. Um, and then Will came to us with quite a bit of certifications, um, which has actually been very beneficial to us in emergency planning and emergency operation plans. But with that, it also comes, we have to send them to training and conferences and seminars to get the continued education to maintain those certifications. So. Um, now that he's been on a full year and we've been able to figure out what we need to maintain those certifications, we put that into the budget so that he can attend that training. Uh, matter of fact, he and I were just at a conference uh, last week, which was very, very beneficial. Um, under the 911, uh, 911 funds, the, the surcharges, those are collected through phone bills, um, estimating the revenue to be at about 464000 in 2020. Um, uh, the, those funds it can be used for anything 911 related. It has to be dispatch related, phones, radio equipment, things like that, dispatch related in order to spend that funds. I can't just, um, you know, we can use it for dispatch salaries, but I can't use it for a police officer's salary. Um, so we're, we're you know, kind of restrictive on that. Um, some of the increases that, that we'll see in the 2020 budget are uh, council agreements. So the councils are out beyond their warranty now. Those were bought when we went and switched over to the 800 megahertz radio system. They're very expensive. Um, and so we have to have a maintenance service agreement to have Motorola come out and maintain those and, and do the preventative maintenance. And there's software and everything that goes into that. Uh, and then all of the portable radios and mobile radios that our officers and firefighters carry uh, those again are also out of their five-year warranty, and so uh, each one of those radios is about six to seven thousand um, dollars. So it's it's better for us to have the maintenance agreement than have to pay for those repairs uh, on our own. Um, new portable radios we need to add because we're adding police officer and firefighter positions, so we're kind of spreading that out between 2019 and 2020, so that we're not doing it all in one year, um, and then uh, adding those tw those 26 is for the new. Uh, for this radios for the uh, SOG vehicles. Uh, so we'll be putting radios in those four new vehicles because those will be additions to the fleet. And we'll be applying, the deputy director just reminded me we're going to be applying for a grant for that as well. Um, so a couple of future considerations for dispatch. Uh, some of the unknowns, we have next gen 911. We're already making preparations for that. We're buying racks and things like that for the, for the uh, hardware. Uh, but there are some unknowns in terms of what those overall costs are going to be to the township going forward. Um, so we'll continue to monitor that. We may have to take a budget amendment. Text to 91 is part of next, next Gen 91, but that's new software that's going to be coming. Um, right now, we are, we're able to receive texts. In the future, we'll be able to receive pictures. We'll be able to receive all kinds of additional information versus just a text message from 91. Um, and then, of course, we've talked about it before, is their dispatch center expansion. We are, we are just simply out of room uh, as everything expands, as next gen 91. Those all, everything that comes requires a monitor, requires a screen. We have nowhere to put the screens at this point. We're out of room. Um, so we're, we're planning and, and, and looking at about uh, an expansion. Um, my hope, and I'm still keeping my fingers crossed, that we'll be 
we'll be breaking ground on this expansion by the end of 2019, but it, it doesn't look uh, super optimistic at this point. Um, as, as Chad just showed you, a lot of these things, carpet and things in the public safety building, we've kind of deferred uh, over the last couple of years because we knew this was coming and we knew that there was going to be some displacement. So as, when we expand dispatch, that displaces things. We're gonna displace the sergeant's office, we're gonna displace things, so we have to move them somewhere within the organization. And what we didn't wanna do is spend a lot of money replacing carpet and wall coverings only to find out that we're gonna to have to rip that up and, and move walls or do whatever. So we're trying to incorporate it all into one big project at this point. And um, that's what we're working with partners in our architecture, the same people that are doing the fire station. They've done a phenomenal job. Um, we're just trying to get that down to a, a better cost before we bring it to the board. Um, so with that, I am happy to answer any questions that the board may have. One thing I didn't notice that on here that you had told us about previously is the um, the peer-to-peer -peer counseling for some of the traumatic events that some of the police go through, which might also add to benefits and help with retention. But have you looked at the federal grant for that? They're looking at you know giving more peer-to-peer -peer counseling and assistance and money to help the police. And yep. Some so we we looked at the grants. We actually. Um, Last year, we brought in training that was grant funded and partially paid for. Um, so we were able to get a large portion of our firefighters through that training and the large and, and a number, a great number of our police officers. The firefighters and police officers that went through the peer support training are now part of a committee. Um, they've drafted a policy. That policy is on my desk for review. And so I'm hopeful mm -hmm. uh, that within the next month we'll have that. They're already out working. Um, we've had a couple traumatic events and our officers and our firefighters are looking out, at, looking out for each other. They're utilizing the training that they've had. They're coming in, they're helping each other now. Uh, we just don't have a formal policy in place, but that, that'll happen within the next uh, probably week or so, as soon as I get a chance to review it. Good, you might want to keep that. I mean, I would keep that highlighted in the next future considerations, because that's important. Yeah, that would it's, help. Definitely, uh, it's definitely in our strategic plan. It's, the, it's, a, it's a goal of mine, um, and uh, it'll be on the forefront going forward. Okay, thanks. Seeing no other questions, turn it over to Tim now. Thank you guys, well done. Thank you. Behind the scenes who helped Barb and others. Good job. <laughs> Tim is next. Okay. I don't see. <laughs> They're sharing glasses. Is everybody okay with continuing to push on? And yep. Okay. Tim, when you're ready, uh, go ahead okay. and kick us off. All right. So I'm going to start off with maybe a milestone. This is my 31st municipal budget that I've presented Third. to an elected body. Are you uh, telling us you're retiring? Is don't know if it's saying? my last one. <laughs> no. <laughs> More to come on that. Um, so anyways, uh, tonight, uh, Bill Surchak, Rob Kramer, Bob Belair and Jeff Goulet, they, they're the guys that basically put this budget together. Um, I'm gonna do the majority of the presentation like usual and then uh, open it up to these guys for questions. So, there we go. So starting with staffing, um, net, no change in staffing um, for municipal services going into 2020. Um, we'll be remaining at uh, 70 full-time staff. Uh, as I'll highlight later, there is one additional staffing or one additional staff member being added to building. There's one less staff member uh, in public works uh, going forward. So that's actually going to happen in 2019. Wendy had mentioned during the uh, opening remarks that um, there's a new position in IT, an applications delivery service manager, um, if I've got that right. Um, and uh, we'll be adding, if the board approves this, um, the 19 changes that is. Uh, an application specialist position that will report to that manager and then have a lateral reporting relationship to Rob. Um, that person will uh, help us support 
all the existing uh, MSD applications, City View, City Works, on base our document management system, and the uh, Selectron IVR. That's the um, software and hardware that's used for uh, scheduling inspections by our customers. Um, the other uh, benefit of that individual is they will be able to assist other departments township wide with implementation of on base um, because that is a um, it's a large kind of township wide initiative that we kicked off a number of years ago with a pilot and uh, it's really proving to be of tremendous value to us. So we'll talk about the details uh, of each one of the divisions as we kind of roll through things. Uh, the budget in total for municipal services is uh, $54.3 million uh, for 2020 and kind of starting, you know, going around the clock here, 3% of the expenses are for fleet, 10% is general fund, that is primarily uh, Bill's operation and engineering, Rob's in uh, building and inspection services including rental inspection and Jeff's, uh, Jeff's costs, plus the administrative costs for the department. A solid waste is 8%, community improvements, these are primarily parking lots and road improvements, 1%. Uh, the new road improvement program that Wendy touched on is 11% of the 54 million in expenses. Water's 36, sewer's 30, and stormwater is roughly 1% of the total uh, expenses in the department. So Rob and I had to put our thinking caps on, uh, trying to project some, some revenues for, uh, for, the, for the coming couple years. Uh, we relied on a couple, uh, couple other assistants, uh, my brother here in this picture, uh, a builder, and uh, of course, Karnak. Uh, but we did our projections uh, very conservatively, uh, making a, a presumption that uh, we're going to start seeing a decline in building activity uh, in 2019. Uh, I think we're probably conservatively low on the revenues right now. For 19, so I think we're in a good position, and we're budgeting conservatively low in 2020. So if you were to compare 18 to 20, you'd really be seeing a 20% delta in the revenues. Uh, that's about a $1 million impact. Uh, those revenues uh, in 18 are 5 million for the general fund, and there'll be 4 million uh, going into uh, 2020. I hope that. Uh, uh, we'll see amendments like we've seen over the last number of years where we come back uh, and uh, add to those uh, projected revenues over time. So just a quick recap in uh, each one of the divisions in building. Uh, we have the one new position, the application specialist, which I've touched on already. Uh, we'll be working on the fourth phase of the on-base document management program. That's to scan uh, all of the, the records within building and inspection services into an electronic system for uh, future retention and use. Uh, we have two capital items in here, uh, replacement of a 2005 SUV and replacement of a 2009 ordinance car. Um, we expend or we, we fund those replacements even though ordinance is um, uh, technically in public safety. We do have that one dedicated ordinance officer now uh, that works primarily for, for Rob's operation. There are, so 19 uh, full-time staff, there's currently 18. This ratchets up by the one, as I mentioned, next year. Um, we'll have 10 uh, inspectors and ordinance officer um, in, in the division, two administrative people, Rob and Gloria, who's our permit and plan reviewer, uh, six clerical, and that new application specialist. Moving over to Jeff's area, um, status quo, no big changes here. Uh, we do have a slight increase of 10% in the tree fund expenses. Uh, this is, as we've been talking over the last several years, kind of as we shift to uh, more of a maintenance operation for the trees that we've planted in the right of way, um, we need to maintain those trees. They're growing and uh, they need to have you know, pruning, um, mulching, and uh, in some cases replacement for the ones that die. So uh, about a 10% increase there. That is being funded by uh, funds that come in from developers when they develop their projects and choose not to actually replace all the trees on their property, which I think the board is familiar with how that works. The other thing in uh, 2020, we'll be continuing the uh, 
zoning ordinance um, update. That's a project that's budgeted to start next year, probably in the latter part of 2019, and then that'll continue into 2020, so we've got 10,000 covered in each year uh, to update that. Uh, the largest ordinance in the township, and I think it constitutes about one third of the total ordinance book, if you ever see that monster. It's, uh, this will be a big undertaking. Uh, we'll have to determine you know, to what extent the ordinance needs to be amended and then uh, start scoping that out and work with a consultant and our staff to uh, make those changes. No major capital in 2020 for planning, so it's pretty straightforward. Jeff has six full-time staff, himself as, uh, as the administrator, if you will. Uh, he has two planners that assist him, two clerical, and then Nicole, our GIS specialist. Moving over to Bill's area in engineering services, uh, but for the roads program, pretty much the, the status quo for, for 2020, um, we'll, have, we'll be working then in probably zone five of the neighborhood replacement program. Um, and we extended the same uh, $250,000 uh, budget line item from 2019 for sidewalk gaps uh, into 2020. So big gap program uh, in, in 2020 again. We did also carry forward in 19 and 20 the uh, painting of traffic signal infrastructure. Uh, it doesn't look like the county's going to bite on our offer to uh, do that this year. Um, we do have some funds budgeted this year those will just roll back to, uh, to fund balance if unused, but uh, it is budgeted again next year, so we'll try and hit them up a little bit earlier <coughs> this coming year to try to get some of those uh, damaged and fading and chipped and worn out uh, signal controller boxes, poles and mast arms, uh, you know, touched up around the community. Um, the gaps, again, this was a strategic priority from the board uh, last year. Um, and as I mentioned, 250,000 is allocated uh, for this in 2020. Bill has eight full-time staff. Uh, he has the administrator, if you will, for the, uh, for the division, three engineers that assist him, a couple clerical, and two utility inspectors who inspect all that uh, private infrastructure that's being built by the developers out in the community. Community improvement, this is also uh, one of Bill's responsibilities. Um, well, I expect both the 2019 and 2020 uh, planned projects to change because as public safety mentioned, they're looking at redoing uh, security uh, in and around the backside of this facility over the next couple years. We're gonna need to retailer uh, the community improvement fund projects, the paving projects to kind of match up with what public safety uh, needs to accomplish. So uh, phase three, if you recall, we did phases uh, one and two this year, kind of on the uh, east side of the building. Phase three is the area generally over by fleet, and I'll show that in the next slide, um, as budgeted. And then phase four is the area just south of fleet. Um, we'll be including sections of Veterans Way to mill and resurface that road uh, both in 2019 and 2020 in all likelihood. And there's a little bit of money in there for some miscellaneous patching. But uh, if you're looking at this, uh, this image, phase three is the area over here in front of Fleet, and it includes the driveway from Veterans back over here to Fire Station number one, and then phase four is going to be this large area here. Um, and that's the area that uh, Public Safety currently has their architect working on a design for uh, an enhanced security system um, to comply with uh, the various CALEA requirements that they need to secure the uh, police fleet. Uh, the new item in our budget for uh, 2019 and 2020 is the road improvement program. I'd love to sit here and tell you we know exactly what we're gonna be doing in 2020. Um, as you know, just last week we awarded the contract to the consultant to help us with this program management. We met actually yet today, uh, Bill and I did with uh, Mark Murky and our consultant to start laying that out. And uh, we hope to have some good detailed information, at least for the 2019 program, to share with the board at the study session on uh, November the 27th. Um, but you know, you're looking at a program that's on the order of 5.6 million coming uh, just from the um, 
the 1.45 mills that was approved by the voters this year. Uh, in addition to that, another 1.1 million for 19 coming from Wayne County. Hopefully there'll be some more money coming from Wayne County in 2020, uh, but we still don't have written commitments or intergovernmental agreements for all of the 19 money yet. So uh, more to come on that and in more detail certainly on the uh, 27th at our study session. Then the last in the big uh, division within municipal services, public works, Bob's area. Um, again, status quo here, no changes in level of service. Um, one new service that is being added, which we'll talk about. Um, but really, solid waste, stormwater, sanitary sewer, uh, collection system, and fleet services are all, uh, for the most part, unchanged in the next two years' budgets. Um, we do have this new program um, that we've talked to the board at least, I think, once about in the past, and that is the Residential Water Cross Connection Control Program. This is a program that, uh, that we'll highlight uh, on the next or in the next couple slides. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will be reducing one laborer position going down from 11 to 10 uh, in 2019 and carrying that into 2020. Uh, the solid waste program, uh, no changes in service provided. Um, however, consistent with the projections that we did a couple years ago, uh, when the contract was extended with, uh, with uh, Green for Life, um, we're recommending an increase from 155 to 100, sorry, 152 to $155 per year in that uh, cost starting in 2020. And uh, that um, appears to be tracking with some laser, laser finance precision to uh, Wendy's uh, original projections that she did back then. Um, in terms of what cash balance we would have. And um, uh, that will obviously be evaluated at this time next year when we're setting the 2020 rates. But for 19, the rate stays the same at 152. Stormwater, um, this covers things like the payment of the township share of the annual county drain assessments. We know that there are three and possibly a fourth uh, drain assessment uh, in the works. Um, Three of those um, public hearings, uh, if you will, the Board of Determination meetings uh, happened in, in 2018. The township will be, <coughs> pardon me, uh, charged uh, roughly 10% of the cost of those assessments going forward. We don't know the magnitude of that this time, but we expect that to hit potentially as soon as 2020. <coughs> pardon me. Um, there is a Another lingering one from a couple years ago that we understand is still active, but again, we don't have uh, the information's not been finalized with Wayne County, and that's for the McKinstry drain um, that we're still waiting on. We'll also be under a new stormwater permit by 2020. Um, there are uh, public education requirements and other uh, requirements under that permit. Um, Bob was approached, uh, what, uh, more than a year ago, I think, um, by the uh, Friends of the Rouge who are working to develop a water trail along the Rouge River. And um, they're doing that with all of the communities within the, the Rouge River watershed. Um, what they're looking for from the communities is to provide some financial match towards a grant, a large grant that they're applying for from the Herb Foundation in Detroit. Um, Herb will fund at least 90% of the costs uh, of the project to create the water trail, which will include canoe and kayak launches uh, along the river and other um, interpretive and environmental education, um, you know, locations along the water trail. And they've asked for our pledge of 10,000 towards the public education materials that would be required for the project. So we have included that tentatively um, now in the budget. Um, we'll see if that you know, comes to fruition over the next year or so. But we know that I think they're going to be applying in 2019 for that likely expense in 2020. We also included um, a small budget amount for uh, capital associated with the township-owned stormwater system in the event that there are some uh, improvements required in the future. Residential cross-connection control program, you can see uh, this is a big dollar amount um, on the administrative side. Um, and we'll talk about that on the, on the I think it's next slide. 
Um, we have some capital in there, about a million for, this is revenue financed capital, uh, capital that'll come from the rates. Um, about a million dollars as a placeholder for water master plan improvements. We're in the final throes of getting that water master plan uh, completed and we hope to present that to the board uh, either at a regular meeting or study session in the, in the coming months. But we do have a placeholder here for a million dollars in, in 2020. 220,000 in vehicle replacements. You can see a couple single axle dumps and one rubber tire excavator um, shared with uh, sewer. Uh, expansion of our cold storage building that was built in 2004, um, 2004, 2005 timeframe. Um, when we built that, it was pretty much undersized at the time when we completed that project, um, but due to limited budget, um, we built the size of the structure that's there. So there's a requirement for some additional storage there. And again, this would be split 50-50 between water and sewer. Then some uh, lesser sized re uh, upgrades to our supervisory control and data acquisition system. That's the computer system that controls water and wastewater and uh, some uh, capital improvement program building improvements. The uh, residential cross connection control program, this is the new program. Um, we've, been, um, we, we've been really kind of on hold with implementation of this for many, many years now. Um, through the Department of Environmental Quality, they kind of gave the Wayne County communities a pass for the better part of a decade in implementing these requirements. But in 2016, they had us make a formal commitment finally to implement it. Uh, we've had it on the commercial and industrial side for, for decades, but this expands it into the residential side uh, insofar as at least the homes that have uh, automated irrigation systems. So if you have an automated irrigation system, and you can see we have 11,000 of them in Canton, um, you have a backflow device on the outside of your home uh, that prevents water from flowing from your irrigation system backwards into the home and potentially backwards into our public water system. Um, this is a requirement, um, has been a requirement in some way, shape, or form since the 1930s in Michigan. I think we had traced it back to 1934 legislatively. Um, like I said, DQ gave us a pass until most recently, and now the Wayne County communities are being required to, uh, to comply with this. What does it mean? It means that the homeowner, <coughs> excuse me, homeowner will be required to um, have this device outside of your home tested to make sure that it functions properly. Um, it's tested by a certified plumbing contractor or certified tester, and then they would submit those results to us. We furnish a big report to the DEQ on the 2200 roughly that we would do per year over a five-year cycle. Um, the homeowner would pay the roughly 50 to $75 out of their own pocket um, to the private plumbing companies to do the test, um, but then we're going to have costs associated with managing the program. And that was what the 200,000 was in there for in, uh, in this slide, a couple slides, or one slide ago here. Um, this is uh, a ballpark estimate that we've been provided by the contractor that currently does our commercial and industrial program. So if they were to manage our program, and that decision has obviously not been made yet, um, that that would be kind of in the ballpark of what they would charge to, to run the program. Um, we've talked with Oakland County, talked with Novi, Farmington Hills, um, Brownstown Township and Wyandotte, and Wyandotte um, who all have this program and uh, we um, will have a lot of work to do in, in uh, 2019 to get this program uh, up and running so there'll be I anticipate one or more study sessions with the board before any uh, decisions or recommendations are made uh, on this. Um, in Novi's experience uh, they had very low compliance on the first set of letters that were sent out to their, um, their initial kind of wave of customers. So there's quite a bit of follow-up required, um, two and three follow-up letters, and each time you have to track all that information in a database, somebody's gotta physically kind of do that. Um, so that's what the uh, administrative costs are uh, in, this, in this budget going forward. Uh, those will probably be refined sometime next year for the purposes of the, the edits that would be made uh, at this time next year for the 2020 budget. 
<coughs> the uh, water master plan projects, we've got kind of three in the works right now um, in this final draft that's soon to come to the board. There's a pressure reducing valve on Warren Road that we have known we've needed to complete. We, we are under, the design is mostly complete, I think, on that. Awesome, done. Bob has it. Um, and uh, we'll be able to get that bid uh, during the winter time. So that'll probably end up being, from a construction standpoint, a 2019 uh, construction project. And then we have two other higher priority items on the, uh, on the master plan, uh, which include a, a extension of the water main in behind Public Works from Yost Road, kind of up to um, Willard Road. And uh, we've been uh, planning that for a long time. It was designed a long time ago. We just haven't built it. Um, but it looks like from the master plan, that's our, our higher priority project that needs to be done. And then an extension of a water main on Joy Road, uh, west of uh, Ridge Road, or west of, yeah, west of Ridge, between Ridge and back, uh, a, a section that needs to be done. <clears throat> so those decisions will come in uh, early 2019 and probably come with some amendments to the 2019 uh, water and sewer budget before we set the rates. On the sanitary sewer collection system side, uh, we have 300,000 as a placeholder in here for some rehabilitation on the system that would come from the recommendations of our SAW grant, which is also in the kind of final stages of completion. Um, that's the grant that we got from the state, roughly 1.9 million in grant funds. We match that with a little over 500,000 in our expenses for a $2.4 million program to inspect our sanitary sewer and system. So we will have a, probably a few minor things that need to be done, but based on everything we've heard from the consultant and the contractor so far, uh, the system looks in, in excellent condition, which is great news. Uh, we have uh, 600,000 in here for vehicle replacements. Those two same uh, single axle dumps that are shared with water are here, 50% uh, of those, and another sewer vector truck replacement, which is a 1999 unit um, that would be a 21-year-old unit in uh, 2020. Um, the share of the cold storage building, share of the skate upgrades, and share of the building improvements are also here. <clears throat> then Bob's operation has uh, two administrators. Uh, he and Brad Lear, our superintendent, two clerical, six operators, 10 laborers, four technicians, four supervisors, and one crew leader. That does exclude fleet, but that's the 29 full-time staff in uh, Public Works fleet. Um, not much changing in 2019 or 2020. There was a little bit of a decrease actually going into 2020 on the fleet side. I think it was minimal on the order of 30 or $40,000 that was spread to all the users. Uh, but where users added additional fleet, um, they were hit with a, a slight increase in charges. Uh, fuel costs are budgeted pretty flat. Fleet maintains over 170 on-road vehicles. Uh, plus hundreds of, uh, of off-road units. Fleet has, uh, budget-wise, six full-time staff, five mechanics, and Clark. Uh, last but not least, uh, we are in the process of updating our strategic plan right now. Um, we're at the midterm. We're at the roughly two-and-a-half-year mark of our five-year strategic plan. So we're doing um, what I hope is going to be a little update. Um, we'll see. <laughs> How that, uh, how that transpires, but we've got a draft set of kind of bulleted changes out there uh, amongst our staff are, are taking a look at that right now. Uh, we hope to come back in early 2019 um, with some recommended changes. Um, if you recall, when we got our accreditation last year, um, one of the things that they dinged us on was the fact that the strategic plan was developed um, consistent with the board goals of the prior board. When the new board took office, later in 2016. Um, those board goals changed a little bit, so we didn't have good synchronicity between our strategic plan goals and the new board's goals. So we're in the process of making that alignment, and Greg uh, Hohenberger has been most helpful in showing me how he did that. So I appreciate that help, Greg, and uh, we hope to have that uh, to the board uh, in early 2019. So that's it, unless you have any questions for any one of the the five of us. Go ahead, Emory. Thank you. You had um, now across the, the state, basically, they're talking about PFAs being elevated in the water. 
do we already test for that or would we need additional budget for that or is that part of our normal testing? Never had that question before. <laughs> yeah, we get questioned on that quite a bit uh, from our residents and our customers. Mm -hmm. uh, GLWA provides our water. Mm -hmm. They did an analytical, that's not me, is it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But GLWA has tested for PFAs, PFOs, all that uh, in their system, and they've came up negative. So we do have a great water source out, uh, where, where, where they draw their water from. So I've actually handed that out. We've posted it on our website. We've posted it on social media for our customers that we do not have any measurable levels of PFAs. It's good news. Um, three, they're all interrelated and they're all fairly recent. Tim, we spoke about a little bit this morning. So we've got the mobile home and park inspections that's getting dumped to the locals by our lovely state legislators with uh, no funding available. We've got the lead copper mandates that I'm learning that we have to have a, I found out this afternoon, a commission to deal with advisory commission local by the end of the year committee, five people. <coughs> the advisory council doesn't bother me a bit. It's the actual inspection and going inside homes to replace pipes. That's not in any of these budgets. Oh, and the last piece would be uh, in terms of the testing, I guess it's, it's not directly related, but the backflow preventers, can that be part of the water and sewer? So that's a separate question. Right, so um, I'll just quickly answer the last th three and then Rob can talk on the first issue about the state and the mobile home parks and what's changing there. Um, so on the, um, <clears throat> on the, uh, the last item, which was the uh, backflow, that would be water and sewer. Onto that um, so that, the, that administrative cost of 200,000 in essence gets absorbed by all uh, within the water and sewer, sewer rates. Got it. Um, so there wouldn't be an individual charge that we would levy specific to that program to a user. Um, it's part of part of the administration of the program. Um, on the uh, lead and copper, we don't have any we don't have any uh, lead we don't have any lead uh, lines in the community, so we don't have a release, a replacement program. We have zero. So that's awesome. Galvanized? Um, um, no. No galvanized. So we're good. Um, we will. We will basically, apart from setting up some of these administrative requirements, like having the committee and having to do some additional sampling and additional testing, the impact on Canton of the new lead and copper rules will be relatively minimal. Okay. Because in addition to the additional incremental testing, part of the conversation today is when we're inventorying the GIS stuff, every time that we're putting in a new meter, are we validating or certifying what's under the ground going into the house and outside the house, the connections. Yes. So and we are we, doing that already. Yeah, kind of our original, if you recall, our original pilot project with OnBase, the, the document imaging system was to scan all of our connection cards, um, which have that information, Perfect. basically, you know, where is the stop box located and uh, what materials were used uh, in the construction. So. We've got good data now on our on our system, and um, yeah, we're you know if we were in an old community, it would be a big challenge uh, to implement the new lead and copper rules. No, no question. And I forget was that uh, the all the water questions would, uh, would be the mobile home inspection. Yep. Yeah, yeah the, the state has uh, given up their enforcement and uh, code inspections for all mobile home parks and turns it over to authority having jurisdiction of the local community, which is the building department. Uh, they still retain the planning right for all mobile home parks only. And that's all they're gonna be doing is planning. So in essence, what they've told me is we have to treat mobile home parks just like we do any other street in the township. And since we don't have a point of sale, we don't get inside, but we have to make sure that the outsides are maintained in a safe uh, condition some of our parks are a little. And aren't many of those rented? Some are rented. We can also include them in our rental program. The state has suggested that. What a nightmare. 
What an absolute nightmare. Yeah, it, o it opens up a lot. We don't have to include them in a rental program, but that is a possibility that we probably need to look at and see if that's the direction that you'd like to go with that. And the funding sources? Well, mm, there's no additional funding sources. And it's not covered in this budget today? Um, no. Right now, uh, our ordinance division has been looking after the mobile homes. They've done a very good job with the uh, limited access that they've had to try to call. clean up the site. Uh, we've been actively, there's one site in particular, we've been tearing out a lot of old abandoned mobile homes out of the site. And correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, but we have a meeting scheduled in about two weeks with public safety public to discuss right. This new this change. I know it's all emerging now. And trying it's to lay new it out. information. So. We also received a letter this week, which we got a similar letter last year regarding trying to certify uh, and accept responsibility for the water and sewer system within the uh, mobile home parks. And uh, I'm certain that uh, either we won't answer that letter or we're going to answer it saying we have no jurisdiction. So uh, I think there might be an issue in one of the parks too with firefighting water. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Yeah, everybody. All right. Any additional questions, comments? Tim, do you, what do you anticipate for water sewer rates going forward, 1920? Are they going to go up significantly down or your yeah. crystal ball? Yeah. <laughs> level? Hoping, hoping for level, certainly. Um, that's what GLWA's target is to not pass on more than a 4% increase system-wide. That doesn't mean that individual rates don't go up by more than that uh, amongst their member communities, but, uh, but that's kind of their high target. Um, this year they came in quite a bit less than that, a little over 2%. So, um, you know, we've been buffering that as, as we move along. Um, the rate system just, or the rate process just started last week. So we've talked about capital, um, and they have a lot of capital needs. Um, staggering capital needs uh, in the billion dollar number. So um, we'll see how that plays out with the, uh, with the rates, but uh, they presented their first uh, updated capital improvement program uh, last Thursday. And uh, the introductory, the main body of that plan is 520 pages without appendices. Um, it's a massive, massive document, um, and the needs are huge, both on water and wastewater. But you don't see any dramatic increase or decrease. If it was level for the next two years, that would be a, a good educated guess. That'd be great. Yeah, that'd be great if we could achieve level. Um, you know, we'll see when we do the math uh, come uh, February and March. Yeah. Can I ask a question, piggybacking what Pat asked? In terms of the rentals, though, if we did the rentals for the mobile homes, I mean, obviously, you charge money for that, so that would that would help. But well, we would most likely have to increase staff. Okay. Our, our rentals have actually picked up more than they, yeah. We, and all we're, can, we're still getting new registrations in wow. daily. Okay. So it's a cultural shift in our community that I can go deeper with later on if you like. Okay. Thanks. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, I apologize for being late. I had the uh, election training downstairs. But um, I saw a quarter of a million for the sidewalk gap program in 19 and a quarter of a million for the sidewalk gap program in 2020. Since the board had, and forgive me if anyone asked this while I wasn't here, but since the board had created the goal of, of a livable, walkable community, has that number increased at all, or is that what it's historically been at? It actually, as a result of that goal, we increased it from 50,000 a year to 250. That's Correct. what I was looking for, and I thought it was, but yep. excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Andy, any additional material to be covered? Uh, the only additional thing that I was remiss to um, ask Diane if she would like to speak about a change for water billing. I meant to do oh. that. Oh, no, that's okay. I'm no, sorry. It's okay. fine. Yeah, I, I, in my budget, added a little more. Uh, my goal, as you know, is to go to bi-monthly billing. Um, with the quarterly billing, um, it, it's very difficult on residents, uh, especially towards November and December when they're having to pay their, um, their summer water bills. And so um, for uh, printing and um, uh, publishing, 
I have increased it uh, 6,000 for the printing and 14 for the postage. Uh, my goal eventually is to go to the bi-monthly. Once we have a full year in, um, we should be able to uh, allow residents who want to uh, budget bill, which would be a monthly billing. And so my goal is to make it easier for our residents. Well, I'm going to be working with uh, Wendy and Tim, uh, so the goal is for the next, yeah, for the new uh, billing cycle, which would be in May okay. when we do that. And um, as of now, we have 24,442 ledgers or residents with water bills, and um, uh, within the last year, we've added 298, so as the building go, uh, grows, uh, we'll get more and more uh, residents with water bills. So when you increase the water bills um, for to buy a monthly, are you going to send out like, like edu yeah. letters? We're, and we're, yeah, we'll edu start working with the residents and educating them on that, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Is your services is next. Um, Greg, are you ready? I waited until you took a sip before I asked you. Indeed, we are. Very good. Go right ahead. Ready to just jump right in, ready to rock and roll? Okay, great. We will continue moving <laughs> right along here. Tonight, we I have several people here with me tonight. John Lefevre, our deputy director, Brad Sharp, our projects manager, and Jeanette Aiello, who is our <coughs> business operations coordinator. She is also the mastermind and the worker behind everything that puts this budget together. Um, she was unavailable the night that we uh, did the accreditation. Um, but we acknowledge her that evening. I want to make sure you guys all um, acknowledge her for that. She put did the lion's share of that work for us too. So she is definitely the the wheel that keeps us turning um, with all of our detail-oriented work. So thank you, especially to you, Jeanette. Um, we are. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Certainly. Absolutely, positively, he did acknowledge you, John, the night of. So we did hear it. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so in 2018, we started our new You Belong Here initiative for leisure services to really focus on staying in touch with the community and trying to reach out to all community members, regardless of their background or any other factors in their life, to try and make them feel welcome within all of our facilities and programs and offerings within leisure services. And that's kind of been our lead strategic planning goal, which ties into all the different board goals. Um, the different headings that we're talking about here are our strategic planning initiatives that tie into You Belong Here and all of our township goals. I'm not gonna touch on each of these different um, bullets that I have on the next handful of slides here. I'll touch on a couple of them, but if you see something there that you have a particular question on, feel free to stop me and ask me at any point during, during the presentation or any of these slides tonight. Um, so in 2017, we started a project with revitalizing the fields at Victory Park, the sports center on Michigan Ave. We did eight fields in 2017, and this fall we'll be finishing up the 24, um, which will help us to continue to attract more people and have a healthier community with more active people at the fields. Um, we started, we continued our strategic planning efforts for our trail program and based on board goals, we really started to partner with municipal services on this to identify trail, gra trail gaps in conjunction with um, the sidewalk gap program so that those things can be done in a coordinated effort instead of one department working down one road and we're working down another. Um, and as we, uh, coordinated those things, our focus has really been on connecting different portions of the community, um, really focusing on connecting our parks and, and um, connecting the sidewalks and trails to our parks and school systems so that we're addressing those gaps first and prior, prioritizing those. Um, we also worked on partnerships with public safety, working for the National Night Out program and working with um, 40 different service agencies on our Do Good Expo, connecting volunteers with different volunteer opportunities throughout the, throughout the 
um, community. As we're looking at creating a vibrant community, we use our community survey to really tailor our program offerings to the needs of our diverse community, making sure that all of our um, items tie together so we're not just off creating programs that we think would be fun, but really using our survey that we had done to make sure that we're doing that strategically. And uh, one of our major initiatives this year was to revitalize and re-energize the farmer's market program. And really, we've really seen kind of a boon in participation out there. Um, looking at our different resources, this year we were able to finally open access to Patriot Park. That's a park that was purchased many years ago with township and DNR grant dollars. Um, and we worked with uh, several developers to create different access points in there and also use the Wayne County Parks millage dollars this year to finish up the connection and the planning for that park. So now that that park, now that park is actually open, that people can go in, park, utilize the, the handful of trails that are out there and just kind of a passive recreation opportunity for community members out there. Um, and we're looking to continually work with developers for different park opportunities, such as um, to really offer parks in our underserved areas, such as the Northeast Quadrant Park that we're working on um, with a developer currently and we hope to have more for you later this fall on that park there. Um, we have a lot going on with planning for our department as we're moving forward, so I wanted to touch on these uh, handful of items that are in our budget. Uh, I talked about our last community interest survey, 29, and we do that every five years, so our next survey is due in uh, 2019. That really sets the foundation for our master planning process that, that's heavily utilized there and then also used by our staff in planning different programs and initiatives and, and capital that uh, the community may desire for our department. The uh, Victory Park Ball Field Assurance Plan, basically what this is, is uh, an add to the 2019 budget. It's a maintenance program with the company that uh, put in the new infields to add a little bit more, top, basically top coat all the fields, regrade them, re-laser level them so that they are held to the same standard that they were when they were first put in. That allows us to continue, continue the warranty work on those programs so that they're basically guaranteeing those fields will perform as well as they do now. And with those new fields, we have certainly seen a growth in demand for tournament play, league play, and also decrease in expenses for things like field dry and those sorts of things as those uh, fields are able to drain much, much better. We were able to really do some comparison this year since eight fields were the new surface, four fields were the old surface. We were able to see how much more staff time and field dry and also how quickly there were times we were able, many times, that we were able to open the new eight fields but could not open the old four fields because we just could not get them into a playable condition due to rain. But the other fields needed very little work because they drained so much better, much more playable surface there. Um, we are looking to do a um, feasibility evaluation on the banquet center end of the summit. Basically, what we want to do is have a study done on the best use of that end of the building. It may be that continuing banquet services are the best option for that end of the building, but we want to look at other options for the best use of that portion of the building that best meets the community needs and also best meets the fiscal responsibility that we have to maximize potential revenue for that space. Um, we don't have a preconceived notion of what that will be, but we really need to dive into that. Um, and then we're looking at doing a master plan for the block to really guide that program into the future. And then in 2020, will already be time to redo the master plan that is heavily based on the community interest survey that I already touched on. And then doing a tree inventory is something, it's a tree inventory and management plan for all of our properties. It's a little smirk there, but um, this, it's actually a very important thing for all of our different parks. This would include parks, trails, can't own vacant land that we own throughout the township, 
as well as Wayne County right of way where we have responsibility for trees. So this would um, create an inventory of the trees that are, that are out there and a maintenance plan for those trees because many of them have trimming issues, um, dying off, overcrowding, those sorts of things where we need to get somebody out there to take down trees, those sorts of things. Um, and it's better to plan for those things than it is to respond when there's issues. Um, and then also a transportation strategic plan. So this is for our senior and disabled populations really looking at um, doing a plan for that program into the future, evaluating what the future of that program should be. Should we expand hours? Should we expand service? Those sorts of things, really doing an in-depth study to give us um, a roadmap for the future. And then fiscal responsibility is obviously key to all departments within the township. That's something that we focus on in our department heavily, always looking for alternative revenue, those sorts of things, grants, sponsorships, et cetera. Um, our department currently in 2019, we're looking at a 48% cost recovery level. Best practices for gold medal level agencies in the nation is 35%, and the national average for parks and rec departments is 28%. Um, keep in mind also that this 48% includes capital. Most departments do not include capital in their cost recovery levels. And it also includes departments like facility maintenance, social services, historic district, those sorts of things that are not typical parks and recreation and don't necessarily have associated revenue to offset those costs. So we're also um, offsetting those costs in our cost recovery levels there. Um, as we're looking at investing in the future, um, I won't touch too heavily on the 2019 items here. Wendy already touched on those in her presentation. So I'll just run through real quick the 2020 items, but if you have any questions on the 2019, feel free, let me know. Um, we're looking in 2020 in this building to replace the front door. Several issues with that, um, you've probably seen it with wind and other types of things out there. Um, all the vehicles that we have in here are based on fleet services recommendation for vehicle replacement. So any um, years that you see fleet maintenance in any or a vehicle replacement, those are based on their recommendations for vehicle replacement. So as you see here for facility maintenance and parks next in 2020. The Wayne County IGA in 2020, those we have to apply to Wayne County every year for a particular project to get, they basically tell us we're gonna, we'll give you X amount, usually it's been around 110 to 120,000 based on their revenue. And then we submit a potential project to them and they approve it and we do an intergovernmental agreement so we budget for that revenue and expense side, but we don't have a particular, excuse me, project identified for that yet in 2020. So we'll bring that to the board at the time of the IGA. Mm -hmm. um, recreation, we don't have any capital planned for 2020. We did add the copier for 2019. That's a new item that's based on um, our rep manufacturer rep basically saying they can no longer get parts for the for the copier that we do have and it's past due for replacement um, so that is being split between recreation and the summit the performing arts center we have the seat sponsorship program um, revenue and expense plan for 19 and 20 and it'll also be in 21 so that's basically just replacing we're looking at alternative options to replacing see if we can do repairs um, seat recovering, those sorts of things. So right now we're budgeting for replacement as worst case scenario. If we identify a more cost effective solution, we'll look at doing that. But then along with that, we'll also look to have a seat sponsor program to resell those seats as they were initially sold for the life of the seat. So when those seats are replaced, then we can redo our sponsorship program. Um, and also in 2020 there, we're looking at replacing some of the brass handrails around the facility. You, you, you would notice if you've been out there anytime recent, there's a lot of the brass polish flaking off on there. We're actually currently working on a, a powder coating option, taking them out, getting them powder coated and um, reinstalling them. 
and if that program works, this is an item that we would remove in the future. Um, the sports center, we are looking at um, doing a testing program for the electrical infrastructure that is the, uh, the um, original electrical, all the infrastructure is from the 80s out there. It's never been tested, so we wanna test all the cabling that's underground and all the infrastructure um, transfer switches, et cetera, to try and come up with a plan for what we need to do for repair and replacement. Um, we have a restroom refresh in 2019 and 2020, so we would do one in each year, and then replacement of a field groomer for the fields out there. At the community center, this is um, seems like a brand new facility, but um, it's actually 25 years old, so the majority of our capital, especially at this building, is really focused on maintaining and trying to keep this a premier facility um, while also being as fiscally responsible as we can. So these, these all, items here all focus on that replacement of doors, um, replacement of the partitions in the fitness locker room. The skylights have been deferred several times over the past few years. Um, we've done maintenance to keep them from leaking, but especially with our new gym floor that we have this year, we wanna really make sure that we don't get water damage on those. Um, and then looking at the future for the golf courses in 2020 at both courses, we have some cart path repair and replacement at Fellows Creek. We're looking at um, some Basically, we wanna try and refurbish the bridges um, that are out there so that they're structurally sound, and then strategic cart path replacement. We, as you recall, earlier this year, we had to do some cart path replacement out there already unbudgeted, so we're looking at budgeting that in 2020. Um, Fellows Creek has significantly less cart path on their course than Pheasant Run. Pheasant Run has cart paths throughout the entire course where uh, Fellows Creek is just sections of the path. It's just a different level of course, different length of course, those sorts of things. So that's why they were constructed differently. So at Pheasant Run in 2020, we have budgeted for um, replacement of the cart paths on one of the nines. And then we would see in future years after 2020 replacement of the other nine. So we're planning on doing nine holes per year there. Also at Pheasant Run, we have some refresh to the clubhouse, carpet and finishes, et cetera. Um, and then a three-year lease on Toro, Real Master mowers. So those are replacement of existing mowers that are significantly past their life expectancies. Those have actually been deferred. And then when we bid that project out, we'll bid it both ways as a purchase or lease and then evaluate with uh, the help of the finance department, what the best option is there. Cable television is replacing editing computers. Those are um, paid for with the PEG funds and the community improvement. These are kind of standing items that we budget an amount for, for um, things like paved surface maintenance. We work with municipal services closely. They budget for the replacement of paved surfaces and then we do the maintenance and striping, seal coating, those sorts of things. So we work with them to kind of fill in behind them with, you know, they replace it one year, two years later, we come back and seal coat and crack fill, those sorts of things. So that's kind of a flat amount for maintenance that we have there. The ADA transition plan is similar that we are budgeting a lump sum amount to be able to address the items that we know are coming on the ADA transition plan that we'll have a study session on here in the next month. Um, the recycling bin, we have one in 2019 for the summit and one for this building currently. We only have two locations where um, GFL actually, I'm not sure, is it GFL that picks yes. it up? Our, that picks up our recycling. They pick up from the parks building and the admin building here. So we're actually, our staff is trucking all of the recycling from the summit over here and then at this building, there is no dumpster for it. It's just the large 60 gallon bins that are lined up outside. So this would allow us to expand the pads at both the summit and this building to be able to have a dumpster so that we're not trucking back and forth. Um, that's the community services budget. General fund, I know this is really small up here. Um, 
but this is kind of a, a little bit more detailed than what Wendy provided in her presentation here. There's no real significant changes for 2019. The biggest thing that you may see on the revenue side is social services. That's more of an accounting item there. We've always gotten grant money in from SMART for the transportation program. We're just now recognizing that in the division where the expenses are instead of putting it into general government. So that looks like a $100,000 change for 19. I wish that was all brand new revenue, but it's just aligning it with the expenses there. Um, our total at the bottom, the subsidy level is actually going down a little bit for 2020 with our general fund items there. Any questions on any items there? Okay, with that, I'll move on to the community center. <laughs> kind of a similar story here. The biggest change is in the capital items that I just spoke of. The 2019, actually on this side, it looks slide. It looks, for the operating expenses, it looks a little bit higher. We have included in that um, the 2019 supervisor level there in the middle. There's a $130,000 transfer to general fund in there. So if you take that out, the operating expenses are fairly flat and that's offsetting for increased revenues that we're, we're projecting for memberships. Our membership sales at the summit have really been doing excellent over the last few years. So we're able to be a little more aggressive with our projections on revenues there. At the golf courses, uh, there's really no significant changes other than the biggest thing, again, being capital with uh, those cart paths coming in 2020. Um, the big thing here for Fellows Creek this year is the final year of the debt service on that project in 2020 will be the final year of the debt service on Pheasant Run. So we'll still have depreciation, but the, the bond principle um, and interest will be gone from those uh, budgets there. Why is the subsidy higher for Fellows Creek than Pheasant Run? Um, in 2020, it's... The percent change, yeah. It's going to be the capital, I think, is the primary driver there. Oh, in 20, 2019, we all, what is the main driver? The percentage change. Is it the pond? And okay, it's the the pond. So what we have there is there's a lagoon um, where the um, all the rainwater and everything comes in from uh, the runoff from the parking lot, as well as. I don't know if it's actually the parking lot. I might not be saying that, but it's a lagoon that collects all the water from the area. Um, and then that is used to irrigate the golf course there. We pump it out of that pond throughout the whole course there. Over the years, as more runoff comes into that pond, the sediment level is creeping up higher and higher and higher um, to the point where this summer there was um, a, a point where you could actually see the backs of the fish swimming in there and the ducks were walking across the pond instead of swimming across the pond. Um, dangerously low levels of uh, water out there for irrigating the course. So what actually needs to be done is that pond needs to be completely dredged out, um, which is significant cost of a couple hundred thousand dollars for that project. We are currently looking and this probably, I think it's actually this week, Thursday or Friday. Yeah, we tomorrow have, morning. tomorrow morning, we have a company going out doing some test pilot holes for a potential well that would replace that. If we're able to do a well, that would be, if we get enough flow out of that well, it would be a significant, um, significantly cheaper option than dredging out that lagoon. So if, if that works, then we would change that going forward. And that would be under the operating expenses then? Yeah, we have that. It's a $200,000 contracted services item in that budget. Okay. Yeah, that's a big increase. Okay, thanks. But it's a one-time. Right. Thanks. You're welcome. And these uh, cable TV is um, fairly fairly flat there. We have low operating expenses and the community improvement budget is 
the uh, capital items that we spoke of on the previous slide. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions for you. Questions? Seeing none, Wendy, is there any additional material you'd like to cover? Okay. <laughs> you do not get off that easy. Um, I did not cover yet the 2020 information uh, and where, where we will end up. So I would like to um, carry on from there. Uh -huh. Thank you, Jeanette and company, for well done again. The work behind the scenes there. One item real quick, Anne Marie had asked about um, the number of retirees in the OPEB and we saw that there are currently 293 retirees and spouses that we are paying for health care. So those, the people who have retired and their spouse who we also cover their health care for. So there's 293 of those. Um, our, op our valuation is due um, up December 31st of 2018, so early in 19, we'll start our next valuation. So the valuation we have most recently is from 2016. At that point in time, we are almost 20% funded. Our assets were at 11.4 million at that point in time, but since then we've put in another $4 million. And our liabilities um, were at $57.6 million. But again, we're gonna uh, start hopefully in early uh, 2019 with our next valuation. and. I uh, get that moving. There is some um, new state requirements that I'm not sure what the cost is going to change for the valuation under uh, Public Act 202. The state is requiring us to use some a standard set of assumptions because the state wants to basically compare every municipality's OPEB liability using the same set of assumptions, which is not necessarily the same reasonable assumptions that we would need to use in our community. Right. So we are going to have to have the valuation done in two different formats, one that is acceptable for accounting purposes and one that the state wants. So I don't know what the cost is. We might need a little bit more money there, but I can't, in, I can't imagine it'll be too significant. Okay. Thanks. So we'll give you updated figures as soon as we have those. Okay, so um, capital projects. All of the departments really spoke about their own capital projects, so I'm not gonna spend any time uh, going over any of theirs, but I do wanna talk about the IT items that have not been covered yet. So um, we have a contingency in there for capital because there's always computers that break or something that comes up that we're not sure of, so we, we add that to the budget. We have 45 new computers, so if you recall, we added a significant increase <coughs> of computers in the 2019 budget that we're gonna ask the board to adopt. Um, this will get, by the end of 2020, all of the computers that we need at the township updated so we can do the necessary upgrades that we need to for Microsoft. So um, this will get us caught up and then we are gonna do uh, more of a four year replacement plan. Some computers might be three years, some might be five years, but we're gonna get on a rotating basis to make sure the computers are getting updated um, regularly. Those had been deferred and our IT department did a really good job repurposing and getting those up, updated and keeping them functional. But we want to get on a more recurring basis of computer replacements and not deferring them so we don't end up in a situation like we did next year needing to replace over 100 computers in one year. Uh, we also have some server replacements, uh, some hardware, and then one of the items that um, has been discussed uh, numerous times is wanting um, consistent wireless throughout the admin building, Summit, and the Village Theater. Um, <coughs> we had a consultant come out earlier this year to um, do an analysis of what it would take to upgrade the wireless, and it's gonna cost about $75,000 to do that project. So we have that budgeted for 2020. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, this is, oh, so this is the total uh, capital for 2020 that we will be, uh, well, I guess asking you to accept that is possibly gonna change by next year once we have our CIP done, uh, is about $2.9 million. So if you recall from, um, again, this does not include the roads. The roads right now are all lumped into a pro uh, professional consulting so if you take um, those out of the mix for 2019, our budget was about $2.8 million before the roads project. So our, our capital that we're asking for 2020 is actually pretty similar to that, what we were asking for in 2019, excluding the roads projects. 
And the roads, again, we're going to talk about at an upcoming study session. And we, but we will not know the 2020 until 2019 specific roads. Police fund, um, Director Meyer spoke on all those, so I'm going to breeze through that so we can get out of here. Uh, the debt schedule, um, this is a summary of our outstanding debt and what, uh, when it will be paid off. So the public safety debt, there's only uh, one more payment outstanding for public safety, and that's for $176,000, and that's in the, uh, using the 911 funds. Uh, Non-public safety for governmental, uh, that was mainly this building and when we uh, did the Village Theater and whatnot. That goes out to, uh, through 2023. You will see that the big, there's a big drop between 2023 and 2024. So we would pay about $2 million. So if you look from up here to down here, it's about a $2.3 million drop. So the big bond payment will be paid off at that point in time. Uh, so really the biggest, water, we have some water and sewer debt out there too that goes through 2027. So currently, that's when our debt ends. Who knows with the roads what we're going to, if we're going to have to issue debt to do some of the roads projects, if we want to do more road up front and issue debt and pay it off using future debt millages, we'll, we'll come back to the board with that. But as of today, our current bond payments are totally paid off in 2027. If, may I ask a question? Sure. Wait, wait. If we did uh, issue the debt for the roads, it would be um, added. On, when we do the annual budget review, it, it would be added to that? Yeah, okay. absolutely. We wouldn't track it separate? We can. If you'd like to see it separate, we can absolutely track it separate. But because it would be considered governmental debt on this schedule, it would go under the non-public safety. We absolutely can have public safety, governmental excluding roads, and then a separate roads if that's how we'd like to see it. I just think about like the, the debt for the... We track debt for the water and sewer separate because it has its own separate, you know, uh, fee. It has and a different you have funding public source. Safety has its own separate funding source, and since the roads does too. Yep. I don't know. We absolutely can show it that way, and that's a that's a great suggestion. So when it comes to that, we will do that. Easier for my brain to at least understand it. Yep. Was the golf course numbers there for the debt included in the previous slides? Then for the where we showed the subsidy, were those amounts added into that? Greg, did you add the the golf course? the debt payments in your subsidy? Yes, they were. Yep. Any other questions on the debt? Okay, back to this slide. <laughs> now we're taking it um, from 15 through 17 actuals. We've got the budgeted revenue for 18, proposed revenue for 19, and the 2020 proposed revenue. So looking really um, kind of going through briefly on here. If you look at the general fund, the top line item, the proposed 2019 revenue is 26.8. In 2020, it's 26.9. Um, so there's a few things there. The property taxes are up $300,000. Uh, the permits, as Tim had mentioned in his presentation, uh, we're projecting them to start tapering off the licenses and permits, So the building. So th that is down $270,000 from 2019. State shared revenue is up about 300,000, uh, but then the transfers in from the other funds is down about $300,000. So they kind of offset each other. The $300,000 that we uh, are receiving, $250,000 of that, if you recall, is a transfer we're getting back from the um, money we, for, we fronted to the roads fund. So that's just a one-time one -time payback. Uh, the roads fund has the revenue in 2019 of 6.8 million and in 2020 it's got um, 5.7. Uh, that's because we have in 2019 the 1.1 million dollars that the county is um, definitely giving us and we didn't budget for that in 2020. Hopefully we'll get some but we didn't budget for it at this point in time. The fire fund has about a $550,000 increase and that's almost 100% um, due to property taxes. Police fund is about an $800,000 increase, and of that, $750,000 of that is property tax revenue. Community center fund has a very um, slight increase. Uh, $50,000 of that increase is from the general fund subsidy uh, transferring over, and then the remaining piece of that is the annual pass revenue. The street lighting funds and uh, cable stay pretty consistent, as does the community improvement fund. DDA is going up uh, just slightly for $100,000. Uh, 
Um, if you go all the way down to um, the roads fund, you'll see that we had $388,000 there in 2019. Uh, we don't have anything in the 2020 budget for that. That's the, um, the IGA we just signed that we spoke about earlier. Uh, continuing down all the way to the golf course fund, you can see that there's we have $3.9 million budgeted in 19, 4.2 in 20. Uh, that is due to the increase in the transfer from the general fund. We saw the subsidy was increasing, the revenue is increasing because it's a, being offset by monies from the general fund that we are contributing to offset those subsidies. Uh, the water and sewer fund has a $700,000 increase. Uh, and again, that's going to be based on where the actual expenditures end up at the end of the day. So the, those water rates will be set based on where we think the expenses are going to fall. So it's almost a placeholder for where we think the expenses are going to fall. Uh, any questions on uh, revenue? Would it be possible if everything, all the explanations you're giving, if you add, gave us a spreadsheet with maybe that and then a separate I can, Yeah, I, can, I have it all written down here. I can absolutely give you my notes on that. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, on the expenditure side of things, the general fund expenses increased about $700,000. Um, that's mainly due to salaries and wages, so that's up about $336,000 or about 3.3%. You know, um, we, budget, we budgeted at 2% salary increases, but it, depending on where people are in the step scale, they also might have gotten a step in there, which would raise their income a little bit higher than a 2%. Uh, and fringes increased about 231,000 or about 4.9%. Uh, we also have about $125,000 increase, <clears throat> excuse me, in um, software and maintenance agreements, and that is due to the Microsoft licensing upgrades that we will re we need. We're hoping that it won't come in that high, but that's why we have to buy all the computers so we can upgrade our Microsoft. Uh, and Microsoft, um, Right now, that is assuming we buy all the licenses. Microsoft is going towards a, and I don't know if you know this on your personal computers at home, but Microsoft is going where they want you to have to buy an annual license and not just a one-time license fee that you have to maybe do every three or four years. We put this price in there that it's a one-time license fee. If it's an annual fee, it won't be 125000 but you're going to see this as an annual recurring cost. So um, right now, I guess right now I'm hoping we can do it one more time. At $125,000, but I'm not, I'm not keeping my fingers crossed at that. Uh, we also, in this budget, another large item is that we have um, additional tree maintenance of $50,000 over what we've had in the past. So I think in the past it's been about twenty-five dollars to $35,000. We've bumped that up to $85,000 in 2020. We should have an adopt-a-tree program or something like that. <laughs> have everybody in Canton take care of one tree. <laughs> Uh, and then we also transfers out. I don't know. I don't know. What, oh, transfers out. I know what I'm saying. We have about $130,000 more of transfers out to other funds because of the golf course and the in summit that we just spoke about. Uh, the fire fund, if you skip down to that, the fire fund costs increased um, very nominally by $78,000. Um, we had $470,000 of that was due to wages and fringes of an increase. However, capital was down by about um, $300,000. So <coughs> capital offset the wages, uh, the wage increase. Police fund increased by about $750,000. That was mostly due to the wages and fringes. Community center fund, um, we had some capital in there as Greg had recently spoke about. Uh, going down, continuing down the list, um, to Community Improvement Fund. That cost decreased by about $386,000, and that was a decrease in the capital outlay within that fund. Um, the 911 fund went from $2.5 million to $467,000. That's because of the dispatch and the extra capital that we had in 2019 that hopefully is a one-time cost. Uh, and really continuing down um, all the way to the golf course fund. Greg already really talked about it, but you can see that the total golf course expenses are going from 3.8 to 4.3 million dollars, about a almost half million dollar increase, and that's mostly due to the capital cost that we spoke about as well. Um, I believe that was all. Oh, I do have one more. Is there any questions on the expense side? 
Can I ask a question? Just for the sure. solid waste fund, what, sure. how far does that go out in terms of, I mean, do we receive a, a certain break because of the, the dump areas that we have? Or, I mean, does, is that a 20-year agreement? Or how does that affect our line? A 20-year agreement that we have with the dump? Right. Um, we get free dumping. Yeah, we don't pay tipping fees. The community the residents don't pay tipping fees. Right. That's our break. How long does that go out for? Is that a limited time? Until the site is full. And right now that's projected to be 17 years. Um, I actually had a meeting with Fareed today. Um, he's telling his bosses 12 to, and he's trying to stretch it to 15. As of this Who? afternoon. Fareed, Who's that? The manager of the facility, the Republic Landfill. Oh. Yeah, I had, I had a meeting with him today. Could be. The last report we got, which was uh, in April, said 17. No worries. Yeah, and then um, the other one, the, um, let's see. Oh, could you explain the, the, the lighting fund? The street lighting fund? Yes. That's a special assessment district, so when homeowners um, have their street lights, we, we end up getting the bills for the street lights in the neighborhoods, and then we bill out the homeowner associations. We basically get the bill, and we assess the homeowners associations for that, for those street lights. I think it actually ends up going, in some regards, straight to the homes within that homeowner association, but it's agreement that we have with the homeowners and it's a pass through. So we get the bill from DTE, we pass it along to the residents and it's a, it's a break even. So a lot of residents have asked about their roads, asking if they could put street lights in. So this is the fund they would use for that, basically, with their homeowners associations. Yes. If, if, to be honest, I'd have to get a little bit educated on how it started and how homes started to get into this program, but assuming they could get into it the same way that in the past, this would be where it would go and we would put it on the tax bills. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay. Last but not least, the projected fund balance. Um, I really just wanna focus on the top three funds again and the general fund um, as a result Again, starting with the proposed 19 fund balance, this assumes that the proposed 18 fund balance comes in exactly as budgeted, which is not gonna happen. It should be better than that. And that this is assuming that the 2019 fund balance um, comes in exactly, we, we receive exactly what we budgeted to receive for revenue and exactly what we projected to expend uh, for expenditures, which we typically don't do. Um, that's where that 19 proposed fund balance comes in. So I think that's probably on the low side the 19 fund balance. But we are projecting to use fund balance with this budget of $2.4 million in the general fund, which is gonna bring our fund balance to $6.7 million, or about a 23% fund balance level. On the fire fund, we are projecting to add to fund balance, um, so that fund balance is gonna be about $9.4 million, uh, or a very hefty uh, fund balance percentage. However, as we spoke in the 19 fund balance, We've got a large fire station that we're going to build. It's going to likely use up the majority of that fund balance. So I don't expect it to be large come 2020, which we did not budget for that pro for that project yet in 2019. Once we get the final cost, we'll bring it back to the board. Okay. Uh, and the police fund is the other large one I wanted to hit on. Uh, at the end of 2020, if all this came true, we'd be at about $5.4 million of fund balance or about a 23% fund balance percentage as well. Um, the other fund balances really are a function of the general fund for the most part, so, and those don't really have to be quite at a 15% because they're offsets of the general fund, so I'm, I'm not as concerned about those. You will notice in the community improvement fund right now, we have, uh, going down with this budget, we'd have about a $5.9 million fund balance. Those are the funds we've set aside for extra capital that um, we hopefully should be able to utilize once we're done with the CIP. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Seeing no questions, well done, Wendy, Carolyn, thank you very much. And the rest of the team behind the scenes. It's a lot of work and a lot of stress, I know, for you guys. Scrubbing and going back and forth and making sure that the presentation is thorough and accurate and you, once again, uh, exceeded expectations. So thank you. Thank you. Um, 
That being said, uh, call for a motion to close. So moved. Support. Those in favor, state aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Let the record reflect there was no public for public comment. I need a drink. You have a good Thank training. You. Are you ready?